Hey guys, this is Vigenius here, and this is the very, finally, first episode of the Taste Taste Podcast. I know all the viewers are not uh, know this, but it took me three and a half hours to set up audio footage just, just to get this live. And the idea of this podcast was really to make it more online, where we put the, the spotlight on chess streamers and seeing their chess journey. So... Uh, that's why we're doing this podcast, but um, we have a very special first guest. Um, I'm not going to make some introductions. He's going to introduce himself. We're, gonna, we're not going to make it formal or anything. But it was his request to make sure that A, it was done in person. So we got it in person. B, um, we had a chess board so we can have some fun play chess. But, you know, he could destroy me if he wants to. Um, I'm, uh, I'm only a human. I don't mind. Give myself that, but... But we'll flip that in too. Uh, and more importantly, just to, um, you know, he really believes in me to set the start to straw because I really, I don't care about if you're famous or not, you're competitive, you know, you play chess for fun, you just, you know, talk to your, you know, you learn to chess with your parents. I want to hear every chess streamer's doing. And uh, I think, uh, make sure we have a good, good time with it. Um, so I'm not going to ask you about chess right away. I actually want to start off with a non chess question. This is my first time ever doing this. I've never done a podcast before. And I'm aware that as exciting as it is right now, I will never get excited like this ever again because it will never be number one. Like there's a first time for this, first time for that. When was something that you experienced like first time that you're like you're never going to feel that same like euphoria again? Uh, to to, say, to, to say, say it live, live the first time. <laughs> Well, you know, let's keep it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, uh, for me, it's it's kind of like winning a title. It's the first time you never get it again. And for me, the NM title didn't mean much, the National Master title. I didn't even apply for it. In America, they just give it to you right away. Damn. We, 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 wait, wait. We still value the, uh, you know, can if... Uh, see, see, we do. We still care about NM. Sure, sure, but for me, yeah. it was never, it was never on the priority. So even I was, I always relish being the highest rated Canadian player without a title. And then in 2018, I got the FM title, and it was kind of, it was very exciting because throughout my chess journey, at many points, I thought, okay, this is going to be the time where I quit, and already at that point, I wasn't playing that much. So I got the FM title and. I got that joy back in, went into competitive chess, and then under two years later, maybe a year and a half later, got the IM title, which is what I have now. Yeah. And so it's the first time getting the IM title. It's certainly going to be the last. It's kind of that singularity. And you know, it keeps me going because I know that there's better and stronger titles ahead that I'm aiming for. But it it's kind of... it's. It's a moment that you'll never forget. When, when I both got the FM and IM title, I know exactly where it was, how I felt, the reaction that both I got and the people around me, the congratulations. And, you know, it's not like I always look back on it every day, but it was definitely a significant moment in my life. Can you uh, describe that feeling for the 98% of players here that will never achieve actually it's probably even higher it's like probably like 95.3 percent that we will never see like an fm title like no matter how hard we try we, whether it's like our work determination talent privilege to be in a country that supports chess like great all those type of stuff but how does it feel to like it, I, i'm really interested in the i am title because i know that was something that you long process of stuff so like Kind of like bring us into that. I want to. I want to try to feel like even get a glimpse of that feeling of of getting it for the first time ever. So okay, so we could talk about both. We could do the FM title first, and the FM title is a much uh, simpler title because to get the FM title, all you need to do is get the rating twenty three hundred. Yeah. And I got it in twenty eighteen, so I was nineteen years old, uh, the summer twenty eighteen in Philadelphia International. I just crossed the rating. I remember. In late 2017, even, I was, or even middle 2017, so a year prior, I had basically started to lose interest in chess. I had lost a lot of rating a few years prior, and I had plateaued. I wasn't really doing well. My focus was on school, friends, and applying to university and getting in. So 
Mm, that FM title, it wasn't something I was always thinking about, especially because I was like thinking, okay, chess is going to be on the back burner. My dad had uh, quit chess when he was 16 years old, so I thought, okay, you know, maybe I'll follow the same path. Yeah. Then I play a tournament in Chicago called the Chicago Open. I did really well there. I gained a lot of rating points. And then I played in Philadelphia. When I went into Philadelphia International, my rating was 2250, and I had basically the exact same rating as my father. We were sitting, seated actually beside each other. Oh, wow. uh, we were on the last boards because we were the, playing the lowest rated players of the tournament. I won the first game, obviously. And then the second game, I was playing against an international master with black. I beat him. And even at that point, I wasn't really feeling like anything special was happening because I had beaten IMs before, yeah. even with the black pieces. The second game, the third game, I'm playing against a grandmaster. I, I lose. But, you know, then I start doing unexpectedly well. And then going into the last day, I have something like four out of seven. And my dad calculates that I need to win two games to get an IM norm. What I had also realized was that if I win those two games, I would cross that 2300 mark. Yeah. So first game I, of the, so rather the eighth game I'm playing against an individual named Ben Lee. He's around the 2370 FIDE mark. And very complicated game, and I'm up in exchange. And I started having flashbacks to me playing Eugene Hua just a few months prior in Guelph, just a random weekender where I was completely winning up in exchange, rook for a night, and I blundered uh, two move four. It was incredibly devastating. It destroyed my tournament. I went from uh, about to win the tournament to tying for second place. And I started having flashbacks because the position started looking very similar towards the end. But I got the win. Yeah. And then the last round, I'm playing against uh, Raja, who's a GM from India. And he, he at the time, he was an IM. And I'm playing with the black pieces. And out of the opening, I'm much worse. I sacrifice a pawn to get structural equality, but I'm just down a pawn. Which opening was it? It was the Robosh, the modern defense. And just an absolutely atrocious opening. I go for an unsound king side attack. He believes in me and gives up the exchange. I trade everything. And my father had finished his game very quickly. And he comes down to see the game. And he realizes that I'm winning. You can see on his face. And and it's it's about with to say there's a lot of pressure is there's no words that can explain it because my father's a feed eight master very strong player and he's he, I'm very tense in the game my opponents are very tense I'm at moments I can't even sit at the board I'm unable to control myself and it's it's really just the last few moments when my opponent finally resigned we shook hands my father slapped me so hard on the back that everyone in Terman Hall looked around being like yo where did that slap come from Whoa, so it was like a yeah, and like it just like echoed across exactly. the hall. Holy crap! And uh, obviously, it's a great moment. Uh, finally, got the same title as my father because he got the FM title seven years prior, and I got my first IM norm. And because I got my first IM norm, I realized, okay, this getting an IM title is realistic. Yeah. The advantage of becoming yeah. a FM through legitimate means is the fact that the next title is actually much is very close. Mm -hmm. The K factor is twenty, so if you just have a few good tournament success, succession, you can get to IM very quickly. Uh, to get an IM norm, you only need to get 50 points performance above your actual rate of 2,400. So it's, it's all uh, feasible. And yeah. in 20, late 2018, 2019, and 2020, I started having a lot of very good tournaments. I played in the Canadian Zonal, where I got fourth place, and I got a 2,450 performance rating. That was a norm. And in Montreal, I played in a tournament where I had six out of eight. I needed a draw to get a norm. I lost. But even though I lost, I realized that it's all within grasp. I started gaining rating. Yeah. I just played the Ivy League tournament representing UFT. We won that. I got five out of five. So I was really the main player that really took us to the finish line. Even though I only gained 20 points, again, every rating matters when you're trying to get to the title. Then, as I said, in Montreal, I gained rating despite being so close and failing. And Char I was invited in Charlotte to play in the beginning of 2020 uh, and or rather or was it the end of 2019 it was either December 2019 or uh, January 2020 I had it was a GM norm funny enough Hans Neiman had dropped out of the tournament so I got a free spot <laughs> we don't know who that we is. don't know who that is so I took a spot I got a free entry they offered it to me so I paused everything I was still in university yeah and I paused everything I was like okay I'll play there for a few days wow, you're in university while you're doing this yes so amidst all this, it's important to note that getting the 
FM and iron titles. I was in university. And since then, I haven't achieved any. But okay, I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> I'll, get to that. I'll get to that in a moment. So I, yeah, I'm still at university. I'm finishing yeah. my last year. And Charlotte invites me. They, give me. they say that it's free entry. And I say, okay, wow, for a GM norm, I was going to be one of the lowest rated. Had four out of eight. I'm playing Carissa Yip, who's a talented female from America. I'm playing with the white pieces, and I need a win. And sh she knows this. And throughout the game, it's I'm a little bit worse than I equalize, and I'm, we're starting to trade. We're going to an end game, and I, I just have to go all in because there's no I, I'm risking nothing. And obviously, I push too hard and I lose. It's brutal because I have to fly back. And the worst part is, as I'm leaving, a player who shall remain nameless comes to me and he says, "You know, Mark, if I was in your position, I would be screaming it." I'm like. My yeah. friend, I don't want to be here right now. I just want to disappear from reality right now. I don't want to talk to you. And he's, he's trying to put his hand on my uh, around me. He's like, Mark, it's going to be okay. I'm like, this is not the conversation I yeah, want to be having I right now. I, yeah, I, hope, I don't know if this was a close friend of yours. And it was not. It was not. It was not. Yeah, because you can't say that. That's, tell, that's even more telling. You're like trying to hold your composure. And I, I, I know a little bit of that feeling too, but it's just like, no, like get the hell away from me! Like exactly. it's like it's it's you know if things happen, I, t I had the loss, I, uh, you know it's affected my game, and I'm going through the emotions and the, the twists and turns right now. Don't don't try and like deflate it. Exactly, right? it was right. brutal, and especially saying to a competitive like yeah. it's a it's a like imagine saying that to like any like like basically like sports like because the way I see you guys, you, you're all uh, sports players. Like you are. A competitive team, you go, you actually been in the worlds and stuff, you've been to Olympiads, like you are like a, an athlete. It's, it, it's and imagine saying that to an athlete, like, ah, you yeah, funny enough, he was a player, he, he, he and I, uh, I believe we played in different sections, but yeah, he was, uh, he was trying to be compassionate anyway. I, I had already agreed to play the Oakville I'm Norm tournament, and I had told myself this, it was during reading week, so yeah. <laughs> I had it in good timing. I wasn't going to miss any time in school. And it was February, end of February of 2020. We'll talk about what happened after that in a second. But I was, I'd already told myself, I'm like, I, I was already having all these close calls. I said in Montreal, I got six out of nine instead of six and a half, which would have got the norm. In Charlotte, I was one game away. Yeah. And it's just, it's just piling on these close calls. I, I told myself, this is the last tournament that I'm going to be playing for a while. Because I already, cro I, live, I had crossed 2400. So all I needed was the last norm. And the first round, I'm playing Eugene Hua. I'm playing the English with the white pieces. And I sacrifice a piece for three pawns. Very, very unclear out position. And we draw amidst a, a bunch of trades. And I thought I had played very poorly. But in fact, it was near perfect from both of us. Second game, I play against Silas Lund with the white pieces. So I get two whites in a row. I'm playing. I was playing the Berlin with white. I sat. Oh, okay. I sacked the exchange somewhere, uh, unsoundly, and as I usually do, and I I win. And what's funny is Oakville is about an hour away from my house. Yeah. So what would I do? It between the rounds there was the the round would start something at eleven, and the next round would be at five. And so there would be plenty of time. So I'd finish round two. I'd come back, talk to my dad, take a nap, and then drive back there, and. <laughs> The day I won't forget is uh, uh, day, I believe it was the fourth day, where I was playing uh, Jason Liang and Joshua Postuma, both in their 2300s. And against Jason Liang, I'm white. I go for a very uh, brazen attack in the King's Indian, uh, in the King's Indian attack. Position doesn't go too well for me. I'm losing. We trade queens. I go for some unsound attack. But he doesn't really stop it. He doesn't contain my attack. So I keep pushing. He eventually allows me to break through, and I'm able to mate him. Yeah. Uh, post Yuma was the panic because at this point I had basically beaten everyone and just drawn two games. I had something like what was it, six out of seven, I want to say, or five out of six. And I had five out of six. And Post Yuma doesn't come. Ten minutes come, Pai. And usually I, I show up five minutes late. He's not there. Ten minutes, fifteen minutes late. He doesn't come. Twenty minutes, thirty minutes, forty minutes. Our, the arbiter is panicking. He's trying to get every arbiter he knows to call Joshua Postuma to get him to come to the playing hall. What Joshua Postuma didn't know is that the tournament times had changed because it was a weekend day. Wow. He eventually comes on his own time 
and he comes 45 minutes late and okay and the game actually goes quite easily for me he's with the white pieces he he tries to play the 1v3 against me he doesn't really i, I know what he's doing I, I caught him off surprise on like the fourth move he claims that he prepped and i was able to win all i needed to do in the last two rounds was to get half out of two and i was going to secure the title i had tangy me go and nicholas with yep. and okay I'm, I'm, as i drive i i'm thinking to myself just relax it's gonna be okay you're playing against a guy who has something like one and a half out of eight he, both of the remaining two players were near the bottom of the tournament whereas i was obviously at the top Okay, I got to play against Tangium White, and I'm telling myself I can destroy him. That's because that's the mindset I'm in. I've just been beating everyone. No, nothing against this man because clearly, even how he's playing now, he and I are about the same level. But I was just in the mindset where I was feeling so you took incredible. My family, yes. my, my village is massacred. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was actually talking to a, a friend, and he was like, he was explaining like he was trying to take out this guy because it was personal, and he's like mentally like building it up like you killed my family my daughter my son and he just destroyed him on the floor like it was nothing to be honest i, I nothing against this guy i mean i didn't know him too well i yeah. the only the only thing i knew because he, he's he recently came to canada was the fact that he played my father in a few months prior and he was dead lost and my father blundered and he won so based off this just pure anecdote i was feeling like okay this guy it's not like the worst uh pairing in the world Anyways, I'm white. I'm better throughout the opening. I'm playing the Queen's Gambit with the white pieces. I rarely play D4, so he couldn't uh, prepare for me. And I play this dubious move that opens up my king, but basically forces him to make a perpetual or else he's worse. Oh. He does it. And I mean, I had offered him a draw 10 to 15 moves prior, which he declined. And so, okay, we finally get the draw. And I had already started teaching a little bit during that time, chess teaching. And so yeah. a bunch of my students' parents had started congratulating me. And before the last round started, uh, the tournament arbiter and organizer, Ken Green, says, we have a new international master. His name is Mark Plotkin. And I'm just sitting there and the whole room, there's like about 150 people there. They all uh, you know, applaud me. And it was really, that is a moment that you'll never forget. <laughs> I play Nicholas Vitesse, I win, uh, even though it was actually a very difficult game, the position was closed, obviously he wanted a draw just to get his turn over with, he wasn't doing well, yeah. but my dad had called me, he congratulated me, and he said, hey Mark, you're playing with house money, like, it's the last game, <laughs> who cares, house money. <laughs> you, you have nothing to lose, just keep playing, just don't be a goofball, don't blow it, and uh, yeah, yeah. don't go for the draw, just play, because you have nothing to lose, you already secure the title. And so I said, all right, fine. And so we, I played Nicholas with Tess uh, for like 60 moves. It's an absolute deadlock position. I eventually break through and I win. I score seven and a half out of nine, a whole point more than I need to do to get the norm. And I was feeling like, man, I am now invincible. Now I should be playing more terms to get that GM title. I hit my live uh, rating of 2435. And so I was feeling like, okay, I'm about to graduate. I was going to graduate in April, 2020. And I was like, okay, great. So after April, 2020, I can dedicate some time Oh no, April, 2020. <laughs> And so there it is. After and in March, the world ends, basically. <laughs> the, everything closes down. And I had studied a little bit with a few friends in March and April, but I... I can, can I ask you something about, um, about COVID? Because we, we had to... I, I definitely want to talk about it. Yeah, sure. Why don't we? Go ahead. You did mention about COVID. And, like, man, like, co like, I feel like any podcast that talks about anything that happened in the past and doesn't mention COVID, like, it's kind of doing a disservice because what everyone had to go through, and then not to mention chess players, but we had to go through, not being able to play any live tournaments, everything is slowing down, mental health is, like, dropping and stuff like that, but there's also, like, positives, too. So maybe you can explain, like, from a competitive perspective, because it's basically, it was a significant delay. I don't know if it was like a three-year delay. It was like maybe a two-year, a year and a half delay for from the chess perspective. Like, what? How did it impact you, both the negatives and the positives? Okay, so basically in 2020, I had effectively graduated. I had just needed to take one more course, and I would have graduated, and I eventually did. And so COVID happens. I had already begun chess teaching before. That's how I was supplementing my income. That's how I was able to pay for university throughout. Yeah, and. 
so I graduated with no loans. But <laughs> it's, if, 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 for anyone who's uh, not don't live in Canada, that's uh, that's, yeah, very that's an accomplishment. Hard to do. In Canada, that's not too big an accomplishment, but okay, in other places it is. But in any, in any case, I uh, I had already had students, and I was teaching about fifteen hours a week. Yeah. And so I was just ramping it up. Everyone was moving to online and it was becoming incredibly easy to teach. Whereas before, I'll answer the competitive question in a moment, but when I was teaching before, I'd have to drive from one city to another. It'd be incredibly big delays. Yeah. You, you know, car crash suddenly on the road suddenly takes you 10, makes you lose 10 minutes or whatever. Whereas now I can teach from six to seven next, seven to five to eight to five next, very, eight, 10, nine, very, but very efficient, efficient. <laughs> very efficient, very effective. And the thing is, I had started pre-planning a lot of courses, course materials, so it became much easier for me to teach. And as you said, very efficient, and that's what made me be able to pack more classes and be able to teach more. Yeah. On the chess side, I was trying to look. I, I had just gotten the I'm title. I didn't know what I wanted in terms of goals. And to be honest, I'm kind of the same now as back then. Oh, so let me, let me, that's interesting. So you got the I am title, you got recognized by your peers, subordinates, you know, people you look up to stuff. Your dad's giving you like the, the Hulk smash on the, on the back. <laughs> it's like, Hamburger. and I know you're thinking like, Hey, maybe the gym, the gym title like looks like it's in, within reach now, but are you saying that the fire kind of died down a little bit or like what, like that, why did it, and if it did, like, why did it die down at the peak of your, like you just seven and a half down now, you crush, like Merciless said, you had a point ahead of the whole turn, well, point, maybe yeah. point and a half. No point, no point ahead of the whole tournament. Yeah, so. In fact, two people, Norm, me and, and another guy, he got six and a half. But no, you're, look, when, when I was getting the IM title, it was very different from getting the FM title. Yeah. For getting the FM title, it was one tournament, I got it. And I also got an I'm norm to go with that. So yes. it, it showed me that, okay, it's possible to to get the I'm title just based off the performance I had. And the thing is, I had played not perfectly, and I was aware, forget about even analyzing with the engine. Yeah. I saw my games and I saw the mistakes I was making even while I was making moves. I was like, I made the move and I was like, I don't know if that's the best move. And I was, a, I was very critical of myself. But yet, nonetheless, I got the I'm norm. And so I thought, even with my suboptimal play, with the amount of mistakes I made, I still got the I'm title. I had made some big mistakes against the GM where I could have probably saved it, and it was it was not a that it wasn't high the highest quality that I knew I was capable of. Yeah. So I knew that I'm title was within reach. I had never gotten a GM norm on my path to IM ever, and on my path to IM, I had a lot of close calls. So the first feeling I felt when I got the IM title was relief. Yes. Yeah. It was. With FM, it was like on a sense of accomplishment. With IM, it was relief because like the way it's fine on your shoulder. You it's hard to explain. Yeah. Damn, you know, third hole. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't a sense of accomplishment with the IM as it was FM. It was just thank God it's over. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, maybe the next thought should be what is what's my next goal going to be in chess? I didn't necessarily have that because I was just like thank God it's over. Thank God. The, the suitcase that I've been carrying around myself, that is this I'm title That's that I've been so close to getting. Remember, but the I'm title, the I'm norms that I almost got were ones that also included travel. So I had to drive to Montreal, yeah. didn't get the norm. So I had to drive back so for five hours. So you were very self-conscious of all, not just the effort of just chess in general, which like for any of you guys who don't know how to play chess, at a, even at a good level, you have to like, you miss one move, you miscalculate anything, it is over. Like the yeah. whole tournament in theory is over. Yeah. But you're thinking about like the logistics, like waking up at these times, like you know, driving like 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers to get somewhere. More, more. All those things. So, came on. When I was doing Oakville, it's about 60, 70 kilometers away, and I'm driving four times because I go there and I go back home, oh, take a nap. Right, yeah, you don't get. Yeah, and yeah, I go yeah, there yeah, and I come course, back. Yeah, you're not, you're not gonna get a room or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not getting room, and in between rounds, I'm not gonna spend four hours in Oakville. I'm sorry, Oakville. I don't know what there is to do for four hours. So I, <laughs> so I, I just go back and it was a good time. Like I would be able to reflect with my dad. My dad would be incredibly critical of my play. Of course. Of course. And I needed that because I don't need to have a high ego as I'm yeah. getting my time. And then I'll just take a nap. So I'd just be energized and ready to go. It's important to note that, as I said, the travel is something a lot of people don't consider. If, like if the tournament was in my house, it'd be different. But no tournament is in my house. They're they're in Montreal. They're in Charlotte, 
and subsequently i had played i had played tournaments all over america and in the world yeah. it's it's a big time commitment whereas i could easily have spent that time with friends with family you know doing teaching whatever i wanted so it's it's a huge opportunity cost of playing because i'm spending a lot of money and it's really a gamble because if i play poorly then suddenly i it's i'm psychologically torn down because i'm i'm thinking about all these things which is is it worth the time is it worth the money let me interject real quick on that because you sound like pretty much like a self-adjusted like chess player from a competitive standpoint is that normal like based on your peers or are they kind of like i will do everything like they're not adjusted they're just like thinking these very like creative like imaginative things but like getting there is a whole other story because you're basically like you're assessing everything and you're determining that hey you know what like this better be worth it I'm putting all the, th the thing is people would yeah i i don't want to say i'm the only one who has these thoughts but yeah. I, keep in mind i'm making the same mistake that i always do which is like for instance in november typically i'll think of my i will predict that i'll be burnt out from working because i work a lot of hours yeah and I'll be like, okay, why don't I take that time off? Try to figure out where I can play. And Charlotte, US Masters would be convenient. They offer some conditions for, for an IM. So I, it seems like a good event. But I'm taking time off work and I realize all this, but I still decide to go. I still decide to go. And I think pe people that are in the same path as me have the same thoughts because a lot of people that are IMs trying to get to GM, specifically my age group, they're also teaching. And so they're also taking that sacrifice. And a lot of them are also realizing that it's not worth it. So do you because feel the, the cost-benefit analysis is just not in their favor. Yeah. Now, if I knew I was guaranteed to get the GM norm, it'd be a different story. But I'm playing in situations where I'm not guaranteed that by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, mathematically, I have less than 5% of getting it. So if in the 95% group that I'd be in most of the time, it's, it's just... It's just not worth it, and it, it brings you down. Just to go back and to answer the COVID question, once I hit 24, 35, I had taken a, a break. I studied a bit, but then I didn't really do much chess. I was playing but online, but I wasn't really doing anything. Yeah. In December 2020, I decided to go to Charlotte, all masks, all that, and I had to come back, two-week quarantine. It was oh, before so the was whole tournament. tournament. There was a tournament. Wow. In America, they were a bit lighter with COVID. I had done... I had done if i remember okay i think i got four and a half or five out of nine somewhere around the plus one yeah. or plus zero mark i it was I, I lost five rating points but it was fine it was fine i was near my peak that sounds pretty like that's that's a that's usually a decent uh, yeah situation. yeah because i'm at my peak rating it's hard i think i only lost five rating points yeah. and it was fine i you know quarantine i was back with my ex it was completely fine the 2021 comes in my father and i decided to play a tournament in latvia and covid there basically didn't exist nobody was wearing masks it, even though it was peak, it was peak maybe in other places yeah and that's that's normal like, that's normal and different funny enough months later latvia had huge mask restrictions because covid would yeah I think it just based. slowly like, yeah. and just like wiped out their health care yeah yeah so I played. I played really poor. I lost like twenty five rating point, and subsequently in Charlotte, I also lost fifteen. So I dipped under twenty four hundred. Yeah. I played in Banff later that year, which I won, but I only gained maybe six or seven points. So I went straight to exactly twenty four hundred. Then Charlotte invited me to play in their I am Norm tournament, and again, this is around the time that I have off. I think it's during March break or something, twenty twenty two. I had lost thirty five rating points. I went. I lost five games in a row to people lower rated than me. So. The thing is, I wasn't studying much, and it was showing because I was playing against people that were during COVID. My chess wasn't there, and even though I only lost 35 points, it's not, I'm saying only, I should have lost even more. A, a lot of games, I just got lucky. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you, like, later on, that was going to be a, a question regarding, like, losses and wins. And sure, chess. we can get to that later. But I figured, like, I, it's, it's kind of a great point to bring to now because everybody me included we all have our upswings and downswings like we have i know friends i know me who've dropped like i think i dropped like 96 points since last like three months or something like that like i know there's people that are like you know trying to struggle they can't win etc um, to me like basically you're telling me that this is normal for everybody 
Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't lie to ourselves. You look at any single person on Earth, it, it, their, their rating graph is in a diagonal line yeah. up all the time because at some point they're going to be facing rating adversity. They're going to be facing players that are better than them, even though they might be lower rated. In my case, it was a mixture of laziness and uh, just viewing tournaments as a vacation when it isn't. When you play, yeah. we will, we like to think it's a vacation. Then you go 0-3 and you're like, oh my god. Exactly. I'm right here. No, you're absolutely right. When I'm when I'm playing, I want to have, I need to be absolutely focused. But in yeah. every tournament I've played in recent memory, over since COVID, basically, I have always viewed it as vacation from work because I work all the time. I, I now I work seven days a week, basically. Damn. So it's any any time I could just excuse myself for a few days to play in a trust room, I'm like, oh. I'm getting the time off. Well, I'll, I'll see you in Newmarket. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'll be there. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm going to be, yeah, definitely, because I, I'm like, I wanted to get back into, it's been a while because I've had sleep, I told you I had sleep apnea issues and it affected my chest. So to me, this will be the true test in January. Like, can I keep my concentration? Like, regardless if I win or lose, like, just steady. Sure. So. But, yeah, no, I think, look, rating losses happen, but the, psychological view i've had of chess tournaments the last few years has been absolutely poor and that's why i have lost i think 101 fide rating why? plans why, why is it poor why, 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 because why, why, why specifically for you it went down to poor so. well be, when people play they don't have the same mindset as i do yeah people i don't study anymore i have my drive is very low mm -hmm. maybe that will change in time to come but but I, I got the I'm title and I was thinking, okay, I'll work hard. COVID comes and it gives me an excuse to be lazy. Even though I'm playing throughout COVID, I'm losing rating. I, I think apart from Banff where I gained six or seven rating points, considering the fact that I won the tournament, yeah. I, I lost in a lot of rating in every tournament I played in subsequently. 35 lo points lost in one Charlotte tournament, 15 lost in another Charlotte tournament, 20 lost in Latvia. Then I lost 15 in the subsequent Canadian zonals, which happened in 2021 or 2022. 2022, I lost uh, a lot of rating there as well. I was losing to people just left and right for no reason. So it sounds to me that part of this was definitely in terms of COVID to lower your drive. Because if your drive was still maintained, and again, there's a lot, like, we have to go with generalizations because, you know, at the end of the day, we know that you're the only one that knows, like, all the thoughts and processes and, like, everything that's going through your head. But if we lose our drive, especially when we had it at a near peak high because, you know, we just came off, like, a glorious run. Finally, the relief is out. We got the norm. You know, we're very happy and stuff. If, you, or if you're not maintaining that, you know, you're, you're automatically going to feel a little bit worse. And not to mention, you're not just affected, but everyone's being impacted. So every day you're hearing, like, the news. You're seeing signs of mass. You're getting a visual realization that, you know what, people are actually getting sick. And some people are, you know, this is actually really impacting them. You know, there's death, like, unfortunately, like everywhere else. So, I am does that, that, does that outside stuff affect you from a chess perspective or, like, even just generally? So, it's interesting. I, I, I went to university in part because I was interested in journalism. In fact, I graduated with a degree in it, amongst mm -hmm. other things. And so, I listen and follow to the news all the time. My grandmother lives near near me. She lives uh, very close to me, just a few kilometers away. Yeah. And obviously, I have to make sure that nothing happens to her. She did, funny enough, she yeah. didn't take COVID too seriously, but every time I'm around her, I, I do because yeah. she's in her 80s. So I thought, okay, this, it's important to make sure she doesn't... Uh, high risk, high risk. Yeah, high risk, high risk. So I'm careful <laughs> around her. But I hear so many bad, bad things happening in the world all the time, especially with news happening now. And yeah. it'll be if relevant all the time. News, by definition, is depressing. And so I've become quite numb to it because I've just heard it all. I've seen it all. M maybe that isn't the right approach, but it, it removes the psychological pressure that I have with following the news all the time. I view, when I tell people, I kind of jokingly tell them that COVID was, in fact, quite a blessing for me because it paused university it made exams super easy because everything's online so uh, doing exams online is way easier than in person teaching becomes so much simpler because i don't have to drive anywhere and conversely you know there's no tournament so i, I there's no i'm not putting pressure on myself to get to a certain level so for the few first few months of COVID, i was 
I was doing incredibly well. I, I think for the first few months, I was very worried about what COVID had, had to bring to me. But when I realized that specifically people in my age category weren't and specifically with my body type, I'm, I don't have any pre-existing conditions. I don't have diabetes, none yeah, of yeah. that. So I felt, okay, I was safe. I just want to make sure I'm around people that are uh, safe as well. So I wasn't necessarily the most paranoid guy when it came to that. And I viewed it as a blessing as I could kind of upstart being an adult. Do you think that uh, overall with chess, COVID was actually kind of a net positive or it, did it negative? For, for me, it was definitely a net negative because it allowed people to study way more than they had before. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a, I never so, thought about so that. So the boost. Yeah. So for instance, Chessable has been around, I believe, before COVID. Yeah. But a lot of these kids started buying these chessable courses. And so what that entails is chessable is good for openings, mid games and end games, but the main focus is openings. GMs would, famous GMs from Manish Giri, Magnus, Caruana, and everyone in between. Kasparov, I think, also has some courses there. Yeah. They would publish video courses for openings. And it's a losing battle because before, even when I was a kid, people had to get better by reading books and here, yeah. re reading chess books and the thing is i had always viewed that as an advantage because i would always play suboptimal or dubious openings funny enough i was taught by my father when i was kid. we could get to that later yeah. but i openings has always been my weak spot and hmm. yeah I, I never had to i never focused on it much i'd always be losing out of the gate when i was playing even when i was a kid but it wasn't that bad before people could actually prefer now people can prepare for all the games all my games are online yeah. all my online games that's are the, there that's that's the everyone can have a meticulous plan for you and if you don't have some sort of like weird like switcheroo or something like you could just fall into it some prep that exactly the thing is i i now must play many different openings so people that's why people tell me they don't prepare for me but the thing is it doesn't matter if people don't prepare for me because all their knowledge is greater than what i know in those openings so and i'm not preparing i'm not and we'll talk about yeah. that in a moment, but I'm not, I'm playing against people, kids who have studied immensely during COVID and you can see these immense jumps. I can, I know so many uh, kids, both in Canada and America only forget about what's happening in the rest of the world that, that have taken big jumps and it really is only in their openings. Yeah. The rest of their game isn't improving that much. Surely it has, but the big jump is in the openings. So now suddenly I'm fighting an even bigger uphill battle of just trying to equalize. Even it's wow. going to be even greater now than before, and so it's another reason why it's pushing me back from trying to get GM. I'm realizing that, and people tell me this all the time that getting GM now is harder than before. R relative, like five years ago, I'm talking about. Uh, of course, all the old heads are going to listen to this and you know point their finger, <laughs> and they're going to be like mathematically no, but I disagree. There's a certainly there's been rating deflation fide has is now going to change the rules and starting in 2020 yeah I'm, we that's a, about that. I'm going to talk about that later but. and so because of that getting gm is now even harder now we could talk about pure anecdotal cases of people getting the gm title uh from the youngest uh grandmaster in history to other people but generally getting gm is much harder now it has to do with all the prep everyone has and everyone sees this as the equalizer but on the other hand, that means even Carlson himself admits this, getting a win in chess is much harder now for him. It's not surprising that he's lost rating. Yeah. And when people play in these open tournaments where you need to go plus five, where you need to get five points above, five wins above 50%, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very difficult because before you're playing a 2600, you could surprise them. Suddenly it's a position they don't know. Even if they're slightly better, you know, it's tough waters. Whereas now the 2600 is aware of everything. They know all the sidelines. And it's really hard for that 2,100 to beat them. And the problem with the 2,600 now is they're facing the 2,300 score kids or 2,200s who are actually much better. They're from India. And they have less and, biases. Like they just yes. calculate like machines. They calculate like machines. You can't prep for them because they barely have any games. And if they do, it's from when they were 1,800s. So clearly they've completely yeah. revolutionized their opening repertoire. And all the advantages the 2,600 had, apart from actually playing better than them, is, is slowly going out the window. So it becomes harder and harder for the 2600 to say and prove that they're the best player on the chessboard. Same thing for me. I play in Canada, obviously I'm from Toronto. And so I always, every tournament I play in, I need to get way beyond 50%. So irregardless of who I play, I need to go for the win. Yeah. I'll give you uh, an example. I was playing a person you know, his name is Braden Laughlin. 
and I was with the white pieces and I realized that this guy just had everything prepped. Everything. <laughs> oh, That's he, the worst feeling. And he, he had maybe, it was 90 plus 30. And after maybe 10, 15 moons, I had 45 minutes to his hour 35. And I was worse. And the whole game, I was just trying to equalize. Soon he started making mistakes and I started outplaying him, but there wasn't enough going on in the position where I could do anything. It was too late. And we, he, he and I had maybe a four or 500 point rating difference. And, this, and he later told me this is all chessable preparation. And it is, it, it, it's part of the reason why it becomes really difficult. Now, obviously, if I had just played just some random move on move one against Bray, I was white. On move one, I probably would have won. But now that just means I have to play incredibly, incredibly strange openings yeah. just to really throw them throw off. It's like literally, it's like you're playing computers. Yeah. It's like the days when Kasparov would play like E3 and just try and throw to you. Yeah, and the thing is, I, I need to do that now. I played into some line that he knew that I thought was a sideline, but he knew that sideline well. You know, I'm in tough, ter tough for water. Yeah. It's really difficult. I play one wrong move in a, in a very tactical position. I go from slightly better to now much worse. And he knows how to respond to that because that's one of the lines covered. So it becomes much harder. There, so getting the GM is going to be difficult. I need to change my mindset. I need to not view chess tournaments as vacations anymore. I probably need to take some serious time off work. Business trips, man. Yeah, business trip, whatever. I need to take some real time off work, whether that's two, three months. Just say, okay, I'm playing. Funny enough, I played in the transnational that happened in, uh, I want to say, June or July. Maybe it was June. Yeah. It happened in June. I played really well. But in all, they had a Blitz Rapid and Classical portion. I played really well in all of them. In the, G in the Swiss, in the Classical, I finished with five and a half out of nine, considering I was one of the lowest rated in the tournament. First round, I was playing someone higher rated than me. So I had finished with a 25 20 FIDE performance rating. Not GM Norm, because GM Norm, you need 2600. And so I had done really well. I gained 20 I beat a young kid named Andy Woodward in the last round in a beautiful fashion. I didn't view that tournament as vacation. I viewed it as actually playing, and I had already had time off work. So I think I don't want to make excuses for myself. I did lose 101 rating points because I played poorly. But for me to have any sniff of going back to where I even once was, I need to be a little bit more serious on my path. I need to realize that, okay, the equalizer that everyone has, I need to buy into that. I need to get those courses. I need to, or I need to completely change my openings, or I need to study a lot of openings on my own because I haven't done that at all. You know, that, that was a very fascinating point because, and I'm not trying to like anticipate your answers, et cetera, but I've asked so many times, and not pockets, but just like, People in our community and, and chess from like beginners to novices to like, you know, competitive players at your level or, you know, semi-competitive at, at my level. And I would always ask them like, was COVID like a positive or negative? And like, you know, what was the negative stuff? And no one has ever mentioned the fact that it's a net negative because everyone's at home. They're either learning chess or growing chess, but they're actually like all the competitive ones are just like loading up on knowledge and knowledge and knowledge and knowledge. And now... You're going against like people that are just calculating cleanly, and they have all the stuff, like met, like all these tree branches memorized, and then you pick the one here, like oh no, I know this exact line, and then you're like, it's like you're playing stockfish, and it's tilting, like it's at least like for me, I felt that that would be tilting. No, that's exactly what it is. I, I I realized before when I got as I was getting to IM that I'm playing against people that are typically low rated than me because I'm in Canada. Yeah, but there wasn't that equalizer. People weren't sitting at home. Now, when I talk to kids, plenty of them will tell me that they study for hours a day, hours, plural. And so I just, you know, maybe I'll put in typically maybe 30 minutes a week to their hour. <laughs> yeah, that's... And that's, that's tops. Like, I don't even know if I put in half an hour. That's absolute tops. This week, I maybe put in two, three hours this week. But that's as much as I put in in years. You remind me of, I was watching a, a Joe Rogan podcast. I, I, do you follow UFC? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, so I, I used to like. Well, I, I still kind of do, but I was a little bit more hardcore, and I would always follow George St. Pierre. Like, of course, he's Canadian. Like, we're all biased, and one of the best welterweights of all time. And I remember his coach. I don't know his name. I'm so bad. I don't remember his name. But an amazing analytical person. He said that he would train people to make sure that you're only trained at seventy percent. Never go to hundred percent intensity, because if you go at seventy percent. 
and you know that you still have enough for like the next day, the next day, the next day. While everyone is training at hundred percent, they may take a day break or two day breaks, maybe hurt themselves. But if you keep training at seven days or like seventy percent, and you're getting like five hours, by the end of the year, I've done three times, four times, five times more training than, and or in this case, studying than they have. So they're gonna crush you in like one year. That's kind of the same thing like chess, where if you got these people that. You know, they're just determined to put in four hours a, a day. And then, you know, four hours of study doesn't necessarily mean translate to actual trips. You still have to have the experience and the drill and all that stuff. But you just do it repetitively. And then suddenly you have 100 more hours of chest studying than the next person that's at your similar rating. Like, you know, they're going to you're gonna eat them. Like, chump change like four out of five times most likely just because of all the, the sharp knowledge. So it's kind of like... Um, it's it's the computer it's the computer it's the computer days. I remember when I was younger, I would pull uh, the Toronto Star. I was like, you know, from like eight to like fifteen, I would go to the Sunday newspaper, and there would be a what was it Lawrence Day or Lawrence? He was an IM. He Lawrence would, Day, yeah. Yeah, and he would write an article of like a chess event happening somewhere in the world that I can't even spell at that time, and I would go through the moves and I would slowly like under like barely start understanding like all the moves and stuff and then there's a little tactics like main and two and i would solve it every time and there was like and i had all these clippings and that's how i studied chess i didn't use any engines i just kept building it over but it was like repetitive i did it every sunday for like five six years so i think that's what got me into like the like the 13 1400 realm just that type of rep repetition uh by myself you know to me i feel like that's a little bit of an accomplishment because you know I wish I could have learned from like any coach. I don't have real regrets, but like I wish my dad was like, because well, my dad taught me chess when I was younger. He's like, hmm, maybe I'll get him a coach, and my whole life would have changed. But it's okay, I don't mind. Um, I actually want to talk about um, well, because you mentioned about your dad a lot, and I, w I really want to talk about like your childhood in terms of chess. Um, like, did you like from an objective perspective? Some kids are just naturally more gifted than others in certain like intelligences. Like some are more visual, some understand like music better, creativity, science, math, all that stuff. Did you showcase any sort of gifts when you were younger that was correlated with chess, or did you just like how did how did you learn chess? Sure. <laughs> I don't know. That was like three questions, but they're all no, no. no there, there's a lot to answer there. So my. My parents are from Soviet Union, uh, from Russia. Uh, back then it was Soviet Union. And my grandparents are from Soviet Union. Their grandparents are from Soviet Union. So they had that Soviet teaching. And it was considered a sport, chess was. And I believe there were classes where you had to, to pass. The final test was you had to pick a sport that you'd be able to best your teacher at. Whether, and that teacher would be typically pretty good at everything. You have to do one v one on one thing, whether that's a 100 meter that's race so cool. or a 1500 meter race or anything. My, I believe my father cho chose chess and obviously he won. So my father was pretty good when he was a kid, but he wasn't by any means incredibly gifted at the game. His father, his father, my grandfather taught him a bit. I don't think my father really had much coaching. He went to a chess club that he frequented about once or twice a week. And there was a real chess upbringing for him. He traveled amongst the Soviet republics, uh, amongst different tournaments that he played in. And so he really had a good understanding of the chess game. And so he was raised for, well for, the ch for chess. And he, he was able to see a lot just by the fact that he was around that Soviet chess machine. Then he quits, he goes into the army, he then moves to Israel, he gets buried, has, uh, tries to get a family has kids, and then he moves to Canada. And in the late 90s, before he left, him and his business partner, uh, his business partner had played chess on occasion. My dad hadn't played chess for, I don't know, 12, 13 years at that point. And he said, hey, Victor, there's a rapid tournament coming up that all these, a lot of top players are playing in Spiddler, Nond, and everything. Yeah. But they're in their own section. Then there's going to be a lower section, and then another one after that. And... You know, my father comes in, unrated. N nobody knows him. <laughs> and the, the, the tournament has not rated. My dad hadn't played in years. And I believe he started something like four out of four. <laughs> and nobody, keep in mind, he's playing 2000s, 2100s. 
And my father has an eerily resemblance to Gary Kasparov. As yeah, when I first saw your dad, I was like, what the heck is this? So, There's going to be an image right here. <laughs> sure, okay, right here it's going to come up. And so because of that, a lot of people thought this was just Kasparov. Or they thought <laughs> this is some grandmaster. So the guy, so the final round, something. My, his opponent has three and a half out of four. He's white. So his opponent could theoretically beat my dad. He was playing well, but he offers him a draw like three moons. My dad's like, okay. And he guarantees himself first place because the, the guy with three and a half was so scared that he was playing against a really strong grandmaster who hadn't played for years or Gary or whatever. <laughs> my dad had then moved to ICC, Internet Chess Club, yeah. which is an online platform. I, I know it exists, but barely anyone plays on it these days. I, I barely remember it. Uh, yeah. But back then, it was, it was really the top side because you... The reason why it doesn't exist now is you have to pay for it and all the top chess uh platforms are free so for ic you had to pay but it was a download the quality was quite high anti-cheating everything it was all there and they had video courses they had basically a chess player's dream my yeah. dad just played there occasionally in the late 90s and early 2000s i was born in 98 so while i was just being a kid he was he was playing some games then in 2004, I believe. So he quit in 86. So 2004, so, or 88, something around that. So in 2004, he plays in the Aeroflot. He was unrated. He got his first rating, and he, he got a performance of about 2250 Fide. His first established rating was around 2200, just a little bit below. And he was going to teach my older sister how to play chess. And my older sister, at that point, was better than me at everything, obviously, <laughs> because I'm only... This is 2004, so I'm five, year, five, six years old. So obviously she's better than me at everything. She's eight years old. And my dad wants to teach her chess. And I wanted to learn as well. And so he was like, all right, fine. So he, he taught us both. We went to a chess club that was two kilometers from our house. And my older sister would continuously beat me all the time. Anytime we'd prepare. And it would always wow. be water waterworks for my eyes. I'd just be Oh, crying. my God. You had a childhood trauma with the older sister. Yeah, beating chess. me. So she, yeah. and there are even score sheets I have looking at the games where I'm just winning and then two moves later I get mated uh, oh, out of just absolute. You had system. score sheets against your sister? Yeah, because you, it was a rated standard game. And so- Oh, you, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, because it's at the chess club. It's, it's right. a chess club. So it was playing, it was two games every Sunday. And uh, I wasn't playing my sister every time, obviously, but the times I would, it was, <laughs> it was bad. I think my, my record against my sister is atrocious. <laughs> it's, like, it's one of the worst in the world. And I was continuously losing to her, but I was playing other people. I was yeah. getting better. I had never really had quote unquote talent. What I mean by that is when I played in the Canadian Youth Chess Championships the first time, I was six years old. There was no under eight section. So I was playing in the under 10. I scored maybe three and a half out of seven and I got fourth for under eight. Next year, Again, I was in the Canadian youth, I was always getting about around three and a half, four, somewhere three and a half, four and a half. I had one really good tournament when I was in the under 16 section, but typically I wasn't doing well. There were many kids who were better than me that have just died off. And I kind of knew that this would happen because in Canada, we have a really big Chinese Canadian population that is yeah. very good at chess. Yeah. In fact, if you were to just click on any section, whether it's under 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, especially the, the bottom ones, almost all of them, over, I would say, 70% of the top 10, over 50% of the top 100 are going to be Chinese kids. Now, you and I can mention some kids that are not that, but almost all of them are that. I've had so, some of my lickings with them, man. Yeah. These, these, they're, they're very good. Kids, man, it's scary. And so they're very good. And so, you know, it was funny. It would be Chinese kid, Chinese kid, Chinese kid, Chinese kid, me, then Zane, who is... Uh, Guyanese and then Chinese kid, Chinese kid, Chinese kid. So I was amongst them and I was never the best. I was never number one. I, I won Ontario youth a few times because I was the highest rated Ontario chess challenge. I won a few times, but I, even the Canadian chess challenge I won, but the Canadian youth, the Canadian chess championships or the, by rating, I was never number one. And I had never shown the promise to be number one. There's this guy who is my age, born in 1998, just like me. His name is Richard Wang, and he had gone third place in the World Youth Chess Championships. I was never even close. Every time I played in a World Youth, I'd get like 100th, 90th. Yeah. It was wow. It was fun. I recognize that name, though. Yeah, and the, thing, the reason why I mention them is almost all of them drop out once high, sc once high school ends. So there, there's this phase of between they start, 
to grade six, grade seven, they're as hardcore as it gets. Then for the people that are in grade eight, grade nine, they start easing off a lot of them. Then 10, 11, 12, and then they use it. And then they basically quit. What was it, your chest uh, interest at, at uh, high school? Was it higher, lower, like relatively? So in, uh, it depends. In the beginning of high school, it was, quite, it was m it, equivalent to what it was before. Then I started having really bad tournaments. And so I started losing interest. Yeah. But then I came back. And, and then that's, and so I, I basically played to this uh, day. But most uh, individuals that are my age, the, the Chinese, even uh, non-Chinese, they barely play at all. In fact, I think I play more than, I don't even play them. I can't even say that. But I would say, you know, like, for instance, when I was 10 or 12 years old, I, I along with my peers, we were playing 15 tournaments a year. So something like once a month, maybe a little bit more than once a month, like actual tournaments. And I was playing on my club. So and I was, the club tournaments were happening every weekend. So I was, basically every Sunday I was doing something. And there was a chance I was doing something Saturday and Sunday I was playing. Whereas now... I, I, as I say, I play, just play for vacation. So I'm playing maybe four or five tournaments tops, like real tournaments. Yeah. The FIDE rating, all that stuff. It's different. And so the, and they don't play. The, all the kids that used to beat up on me all the time, they don't play. The ones that give me trauma, they don't play. And, you know, they'll play maybe once a year. You'll see them somewhere. But some I know that have quit. Like Richard Wang, who I mentioned, who was at one point a thousand points higher rated than me. A thousand. <laughs> what? He has not played. And now he's, at one point I had surpassed him in rating. But the, the funny thing is, it's not that I necessarily got so much better. They just stagnated. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm slowly, slowly getting up and they're just staying afloat. During high school, did you, like, obviously you had your dad teaching you. But did you have any sort of like, like what really, <laughs> I'm asking this because like from a 1900 perspective, I know it took me like 100,000 hours to get there just like, just grinding online and playing and just slowly just getting a little bit better. Like, what, but how, how did you, like, really, like, skyrocket at, at the, because at, at your age, at 25? Okay, so, yeah, so I, I, we should go back to, so what, I, I didn't really answer the question in the beginning. So when I, I started when I was five, I, I didn't really show a lot of talent. And again, throughout my youth, I had, people always knew who I was. I was top 10 in Canada and one of the best in Ontario. Uh, yeah. So I'd show, people knew who I was, I showed promise, but by no means was anyone saying, oh my God, this is gonna be the next big thing in Canada, by no means. The only reason why I've gotten to where I've gone is because I've never quit. If people have just taken the path I have, I wouldn't be surprised there'd be m way more I am. Interesting. So at no point, even when I was getting the FMI intels, I got them pretty late in life. Compare them, like we have a new grandmaster, Sean Rodriguez Lemieux. Yes. He got all his titles way before I did. On, along his timeline like he he got his gm title in the first year of university in my first year of university i didn't even get my fm title so he's way beyond where i was he's a rare case but he's an example of someone who didn't quit throughout and he again he showed some pro he, of course he was one of the best for his age groups but but nobody was saying wow this guy's gonna be the next thing because for a while he was stagnating at 2200 feet and we're going to talk about stagnation in the moment he was stuck at 2200 for a while I remember when I got my Norman Montreal, he was 2200 there. A few years ago, he was 2200. So pre COVID, like 2019, he was 2020, he was that as well. So I didn't, I didn't really think much of him. I knew he was a strong player, but the jump, obviously, through COVID, he put a lot of effort in and he deserves all the yes. success he's had. He's a fantastic player and one of the only good guys in chess that I like who are, who are, who are that strong. <laughs> who are that strong? There's people you don't like. <laughs> oh my God, where do I begin? But anyway, so. Mm -hmm. I played a lot as a kid, going to chess clubs, didn't show a lot of promise. My dad was teaching me, and my dad also very weak in openings to his level. And I, ha I was taught by the Soviet method, which is you go backwards to forwards. You, you learn from the end games, you learn the absolute fundamentals first, and then you move over to the middle game and then the opening. So I would always be playing where I'd be losing in the opening. There were famous games I had where I was playing a rook end game down four pawns and I won. I was playing a guy named Hugh Sidley once where it was a rook and F pawn. Hugh Sidley's 2000. So I had a rook and F pawn and he had FGH. So he had th two extra pawns on me. My pawn was not passed. His pawn was controlling mine. I took all of his pawns. He was still, it was still holdable and he lost. He didn't know the full door position. So people typically didn't, people typically don't know end games well. And so I was, taught that after a few really embarrassing tournaments by me as a kid my dad consulted with a few russians 
who whose kids did well, yeah. especially Mark Blustein's dad, Ilya Blustein. And he said, my dad said, look, like my son, like I'm putting so much work into him, but there's nothing happening. And Ilya said, look, I'm also around your level, Victor. And he was, he was a little bit worse. And he said, look, I wasn't teaching my kid all the time. I got him a coach. And he, the coach I was recommending was Yura Ochkus, who is a coach from, I believe, Odessa from Ukraine. Brilliant guy. I've had a few coaches since then. And to my, and I'm a coach now, yeah. but I'm willing to say he is the best coach in Canada. Uh, he taught me, well, he ignited a passion for me above all else to get better. Whereas before it felt like I had to hit a few strides, I had to hit different benchmarks. He made it seem like, no, you want to enjoy the process. And he made it fun. He made it entertaining. I credit it to him. And the funny thing is he lived in Mississauga, so he was far away from where I lived. Yeah. And yeah, you know, even when I'll see him now, I'm super thankful for what he's done. If I didn't have Euro as a coach, I uh, I wouldn't have gone where I had. Can After, you give, yeah, go ahead. Sir. Can you give an example of how he ignited that passion? And I'm saying this from just me being a fan, and also being like a chess coach myself. Like, is you know, we we try and find what the student like, what makes them tick. That's like yeah. kind of the thing. But so, hearing that from a competitive standpoint, that that's interesting. So. Just a, just a back note on Yura. Yura had taught Mark Blustein, who's now a grandmaster. He's taught many different title players in Canada. So he, he has a lot of accolades when it comes to teaching. So for instance, he would gift me Tim Horton's donuts. That just for solving a puzzle or, or hot chocolate. Huh. And for him, it was like three, four extra dollars. So it was you know, pennies. But for me, it was like, wow, like I'm getting something. So it was that award system for actually going to the next step. And he would give me words of encouragement for doing well. When you grow up in a Soviet family, words of encouragement don't happen <laughs> often. So, uh, you know, he gave me that. And so I felt that, you know, later I had a coach, Nikolai Naritsyn, who's a competitive player. He's almost grandmaster himself. Yeah. And he's much more of the strict mindset. And no doubt he's a strong player. And I don't want to compare the two. For me, he, you, the reason why I moved on from Euro is because I was surpassing him in rating. But looking back, maybe that wasn't necessarily the right decision because Euro has interest in the game itself. He would study the games, he needed to talk about it, give me that pure kid enjoyment. He's like, oh my God, Mark, did you see what happened? In this? Yeah. And I, I never experienced that. Even with coaches afterwards, it's, it was more like, okay, let's take a look at your game, let's do this, let's do that. But for him, it's like, oh my God, so there's this game just now that had this maybe you can try that let's take a look at it and we play it out that and talk energy and is infectious. Yeah, absolutely and so i i it's hard to replicate so i try uh with my students but if anyone asks me to recommend a coach i always say i always have him on the top of my list even to this day i mean he's a little bit older than my father i believe he's in his late 50s yeah but you know still very sharp i i really really like his teaching method methodology and I wouldn't have been where I'd gone without him. Important to note that he was actually teaching a lot of my competitors. A few, uh, like Jackie Pang, who was a top female in my grade. She was also at one point one of the best in our grade, regardless of gender. So she was really strong for both genders. Yeah. And that's interesting to mention because there's very big gaps in Canada uh, amongst genders. But she was really a superstar and he was coaching her. He was her coach. So you're as looked up to by many different individuals. I'm not naming some obscure coach most people haven't heard of. Yeah. So there you go. Wow, no, that's quite something. Uh, I like I, I find that like any way to get someone like have a goal in mind and make it infectious and make it energetic. <laughs> most important, especially when it comes to kids, like make it fun. Like I have a couple of students now that are like I think like even twelve, and you know, just. Like you, you want to take some enjoyment of them solving something too, because it's like you set a position. It's not like tactics or anything, but it's like you know, find the right move or find the right defense, and then you see like they're like tick 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 tick, and then once they find it, you're like, yeah, you got it, because it's like you see like it helps you to see that they're progressing. That means something you're saying is works, and it doesn't have to be everything, but and that's another way I look at it too is uh when I teach, if they just improve slightly or understand like even one concept. I feel like I've done my job. And then as long as we do, and then the next lesson we learn something else or next time we repeat and then they can like sink into memory. Like I think you make it a fun way. It's 
Um, and it, it's just they feed off your enthusiasm. And then who knows? Like they will just want to, they'll maybe break the barrier and then in, in, in when it gets to like um, high school and they want to continue on it for chess more and more and more. And, and I'm really glad that there's more chess happening, at least from my perspective, like in Ontario, like especially with schools. I remember when I was younger in Quebec, it was like part of the curriculum, like to like learn chess and not nothing, not necessarily for mathematics, but just for like critical thinking, problem solving, uh, knowing how to lose. I think our, this generation kind of needs a little bit of emphasis on knowing how to lose. Um, but yeah, let's talk about um, CFC. Um, and I, I really wanted to talk to, I, I'm, this is like a question I really can't really ask too many people because they're not in the competitive scene. Right. They're not playing like from an international perspective. Like I'll, okay, I'll give you my perspective, which it's like a, it's it's a perspective, but it's not like you know it's just from what I see and how I feel. Like I feel like it's kind of like Canada's kind of like um, football or soccer team. We finally made it to the uh, you know, the world stage, but we're a decade behind, or something like that. And I know we have like international players like Ian, and Red. We're still killing it, but I feel like Canada's still kind of behind chess wise like development wise or you know government doesn't even recognize chess as a sport if I, if I understand this correctly so there's no funding there like does that how how far behind or maybe we're not as far behind as compared to other countries in your opinion okay so there's a lot to talk about there so <coughs> quebec has uh subsidized chess i believe they're they're a borderline like a socialist province so they're able to give out money to quebec chess players that's why it's not surprising that at one point there were half the Olympia, Olympic team members were from Quebec. Yeah. That has since waned, but now you have Sean, Rodrigo Lemieux, you have other players who are very strong in Montreal, who show a lot of potential, and who just are strong as they are. So Montreal, uh, so Quebec has given funding. Canada, you're right, there is a petition from our Vice President Olga Mouchtoller to try to get chess as a sport, not for the sake of getting it as a sport, we don't care about that. We just want to get that funding. Yeah. I think we had some sitting politicians that were endorsing that idea, but it didn't go anywhere. We had basically every chess player sign that petition, but you know, that's not enough. It's interesting. We, we can compare our country to others. It's important to know that our population is small compared to America's, for instance. Their population is north of 330 million. Ours is under 40 million. Yeah. So it's almost you know, 10 to 1, 9 to 1 kind of situation in terms of population. They have a lot. So if we just take, we'll, I want to talk about Europe and Asia in a moment, but if we just take a look at America, they have a lot of hidden advantages that people don't talk about. A, they have a lot more players. So what that means is they can run big tournaments. They have the thing called the Continental Chess Association, which in my opinion is run to the lowest quality standard possible based on the fact that they don't supply any boards or pieces. So it's already a big negative or clocks. So famously, grandmasters who will play against each other who don't have sets, they can't do anything. Sometimes we'll just like write a few moves on the score sheet and just say it's a draw or something. Wow. Well, because that's... so that so even though the quality is so low, just because they're in America, they can get away with it because they have so many people. Yeah. And so that means the prize funds can be immensely high. Like there's this guy named Maurice Ashley who tried to run millionaire chess with, with, with prize money yeah. accumulating over a million. That didn't work. That was a little bit too ambitious. But you can run easily. Like World Open, I believe, every year has prizes combined over 100,000 American dollars. It's a lot. And even for the lower sections, it could take you out of the poverty line. So you don't have to worry about sandbag and all that. But that's a whole different issue. But people will see that as an opportunity to actually get there. So if I'm 1400, I can see, wow, there's $10,000 on the line, I'll play. Whereas in Canada, you know, there's 500, $300 on the line. That's not worth my weekend because you're not, even if you win first place, if you're only, if we're only talking about for the money, not for the love game, if you're in it just for the money, you're making less than minimum wage. Yeah. I think Eric Hansen did a good job. Yeah, 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 we yeah, could yeah, talk yeah, about yes, that. Yes. He did a good job uh, kind of distilling the cost of Isle of Man of the Grand Swiss, and we're talking about the most elite tournament. Yeah, but let's yeah. not even talk about that. If I were to play a tournament in Canada, I would, unless it's the Canadian Open, I believe, or the Close, I would make more money teaching, irregardless of how I do. So I could gain a ton of rating. We could talk all that love of the game, sure, and all this, all that. And of course, I love playing more than teaching. But yeah, 
if I'm only in it for the money, it's incredibly stupid. And the thing is, I hear a lot of arbiters who are in that conversation who are like, they're in it for the money, but the money in Canada is so low that they would make more money doing other things like teaching. Now, if you like arbiting, whole different story. If you like playing, whole different story. Yeah. But if you're in it only for the money, you're not going to get far. Not the most feasible. In, it's uh, not feasible at all. Yeah. It, because I can just talk about myself personally. There are title players who are stronger than me, who have even greater titles, who I know make annualized less than me, yet they're way more successful in the chess tournament scene. If I were to tell you that, you'd be shocked because in a chess tournament scene, maybe I'm making $1,000 a year combined, and they're making maybe 10. But that doesn't matter, again, because we're looking, you have to look at it by hour. How much money, how much yep, time yep, are they yep. investing? How long, how, how much energy, how long does it take for them to get there? If they live in Montreal, to get to Ottawa, or, because Ottawa has a chess scene, or from Ottawa to Toronto, or anywhere else. What, what, actually, that's interesting. What do you feel are, like the percentage of chess players competitively? Like your so let's say two thousand and higher that are playing tournaments specifically for the money. Like, I'd say when you start getting to players near my level and above, you're you're getting some pretty decent numbers. Uh, I would say over fifty percent. Wow. And the thing is, they're they're it's flawed thinking. They yeah. they, they they say, oh, I'm not going to play because the money is not large enough. But here it is. I, there was a tournament recently in Hard House, right? In the winter, yeah. they had one in the winter. But the first place was thirteen hundred. I think second was seven hundred. So they got a thousand dollars for first. So that's a whole weekend and a Friday evening. That's a lot of time. If you just talk about it hour by hour, they're they're not making that much. They have to get there. And they have to spend money on food. Then their time wasted between the rounds. It's not like oh, they get to actually do something productive. Yeah. No, they're doing absolutely nothing productive. And I know chess players, they need a rest, but this is my point. Whereas you could have done the weekend anything you wanted. And that's, we're only talking about people that got first. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, that's a good point. Because in subsequent sections, it's much less. The open section typically, prize money is over 100% of entry fees. But in other tournaments, you know, they could be much less. Uh, I, you, you mentioned Newmark. I'm going to be playing a tournament in Newmark where I think first is 300. 350. Okay, 350. <laughs> so that's assuming there's 50 registered. Uh, well, there will be, yeah. but yeah. there the the again in America the whole point is if you're only in it for the money in America you can be you could be a typical 1500 and you could just say I'm only in it for the money and it makes sense. Wow, it makes sense if you pick your tournaments and you do well and then in other tournaments you throw your rating. That's USCF has tried to. I, I know a few Canadians that do that, but yeah. In Canada, it's actually, and I know some as well. In Canada, it's incredibly. It's even worse than teaching and coach and playing because there you're paying money and a, wasting a weekend to effectively burn rating. Congratulations! Only to then the next tournament win it all back. And then your and, men mental state is like completely off the door because you're just like tilted that you went zero and five. No, but let's say you went zero and five out of your own volition. You were purposely losing. Oh, you, would, yeah. you were purposely losing, and then the next tournament you won all your five games. You're gaining maybe two hundred dollars. From both so weeks, so four hundred dollars. So much time. So much time. Yeah. Like again, not to talk anything bad, but minimum wage would pay more than this. Yeah. And in America, they've tried to combat this by setting rating floors. So, for instance, my rating floor is twenty two hundred, which I think is the highest. So that means that I can't play. Can you explain the rating, rating floor? floor? Is exactly what it sounds like. So that means that if my rating, if I'm twenty two hundred and I lose, I lose to you anyone nine times or any games, my rating will stay 2200. Oh, I so I will always be 2200, irregardless of that. The whole point is to, again, to minimize the like, sandbag. Yeah. Now, what this usually does is it just penalizes old players because when you're old and you're losing rating. So I think I would change that based off age. I'd have an index, which would be like, okay, every subsequent year after 60, you go down 50 points or 50, whatever you want. But, you know, Obviously, people could play around with any system that there is. So in America, the big issue uh, to answer the question is there's a ton more players, a ton more money because of that. And we haven't even talked about sponsors. So in Saint, there's the St. Louis Chess Club, which has Rex Sinkfield, which is an oil, oil magnet. He has made, oh, his net worth is over $40 billion. So for him to lose 10, let's say he's burning $10 million a year. That's what I hear. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less. It's dollars. It's, it's, yeah. it's, for yeah. us, it's in it, comparison, it's penny. Like it's, it's a, it's a sideshow. It's a hilarious. And the thing is he's funded so many tournaments all over the world. And because of their, their because of him, there's a big circuit. It's unclear what would, what the chess world would be like without him. Yeah. I think much worse. And there's a lot of criticism to go about him with what happened with St. Louis a year ago. We talked about that, but just on, on Rex, 
at the Sinkfield thing is him and his family have donated tons of money. And because of that, St. Louis, which has is a dying city, effectively every year they have less and less people and there's more crime there. It was booming city a hundred years ago. It's one of the best cities to live in, whereas now it's one of the, it's not up there at all, yeah. but he's just created it out of nowhere. And so now a ton of grandmasters just live there now. And so because of that, chess has improved. So we don't have that. We don't have that billionaire sponsor. Now we have this guy named Salim uh, who's trying to run some tournaments and he is burning some money, but you, you just can't compare the two. And yeah. he's doing, and by the way, this is not just slanderous. He's, Salim is doing a fantastic job. Again, without him, Canadian chess would be much worse. The yeah, transnational. I, I, I don't personally. Yeah, he's, really he's a great guy. And tr he even let me stay at his place. Trans transnational was a big success. He's, uh, he also ran a Maplewood in a norm tournament, which I played in. He does a great job for chess, but the scale is like incomparable. We're, we're talking about somebody worth billions of dollars, willing to burn millions of dollars a year on chess, and he doesn't care. So can, the question is, what will happen if he passes away or anything? Can the can, okay? Let's just I'm just throwing it out there. Can the provincial or federal government? Well, let's say a federal for a second. Let's just say <laughs> they had. Uh, let's say that they will do three wishes to make chess better in Canada. Whoever it is, whoever leader it is, like it, it, it gets passed. What are the three things that the Canadian government can do to make either chess better, whether it's like grow chess, more titled players, more of like better hosting tournaments? Because well, we are getting the candidates, which is like I don't even think we've ever hosted a candidate. Okay, so that's interesting. We can talk about the candidates in a moment. That's interesting. Um, so Britain, United Kingdom, is doing an interesting thing where their leader is trying to make a law passing chess in schools, like mandatory. Wow. And I think they're doing this, they've done, they do this in most Soviet republics, or they allow it as a elective in high school or whatever. So chess is actually viewed as, the, the, the problem is when, when, okay, just to take a step back, when the idea of having chess as sport was, okay, let's say it's passed. Let's say the Canadian Federation now has a million dollars a year to spend. What do we do with it? We could send it to people like me and title players, but that's really dumb because we'll play anyway. What you want to do is you want to invest in the young kids. And that's what basically all the critiques were. And I totally agree. You don't need to make better conditions for me. I play in the worst of conditions, you know? There's no... <laughs> that's a... <laughs> yeah, exactly. No worries. Yeah. I, I play in the worst of conditions. So you don't really need to convince me to play anywhere. If I, if I have the free time and I want to play, I'll play. If I need to drive yeah. to Smith Falls, I'll do it, yeah. which is the middle of nowhere. Or if I need to, <laughs> if I need to draw, it, I, I used to play in tournaments with basements where I'd hit my head every time I'd get up. I used to play in bars when I was a kid with people smoking indoors, people yelling at me, drunk, swearing. Uh, I've heard anti-Semitic things thrown at me. I've heard it all. And yeah. the thing is, I, it doesn't really bother me, but the point is I'll play in under any conditions. And most title chess players that I know, they like chess, they'll play under any conditions. Uh, so. Getting them involved is not difficult. The, we need to invest in the future generations to make sure that it's actually instilled in them. And if you know, some, if ninety percent quit, great. But at least we have the ten percent that will, you know, keep that and uh, take it forward. I think now, as I have almost a duty as a chess coach to preserve the way I've been taught and raise uh, new kids. That's why I'm always so excited when I see my students do well because yeah. I feel like the method that I've done works now of course every coach has their own we've talked about that but going back to the question is in europe it's completely different than what we have here they have a totally different system in soviet union as i said chess was viewed as a sport so that got a lot more attention than your typical board game it wasn't monopoly or checkers it was actually seen like okay this can actually push you and this can actually be good for you so it could be viewed as a com something that you could actually play competitively something that can be healthy for you something that keeps your brain going uh, funny enough, there's I think there's zero strong chess players in history that have gotten Alzheimer's, so that's yeah I, I heard about that too. So that's that's really impressive. It's all brain engagement. It's all brain engagement, and I know Alzheimer's has some genetics involved. I I can't speak to the science of it, but it's very impressive uh, that uh, what chess has done in Europe. Different countries have different things. And Iceland, Iceland, for instance, has the most amount of grandmasters per capita. The reason for that is they had in 1972, the World Chess Championship between Boris Spassky and Bobby Fischer, and every Grandmaster is a product of that. Chess boom. Of the, yeah, chess boom that wow. has never died. And 
in Iceland, they don't have any notable strong players. They have historic players like Olofsson, but they don't have any strong, great chess players that are going to be like in the top. Super GMs or something no. like that. But they have the most GMs per capita. They have a population of like 300,000. So they have 1% of what we have. But way, way they have more Grand Masters than we do. Wow. So they had a huge chess boom just because of the, the most famous chess event in history happening there. So do you think, when well, we're transitioning that, the Kents, you think there might be a chess group in Canada? For no, no. I actually think it's overblown. I think all the hype about the candidates is overblown. I, want to, I, I just want to finish the point and I'll get yeah, to yeah. that. So in, in Eastern Europe, in Armenia, for instance, as I said, chess is viewed as a sport. In Asia, like Uzbekistan, suddenly you have all these child prodigies like Nordebek, Abdus Sitarov, Yakuboyev is there, uh, Vahidov, etc. The government is actually giving them money and they're giving them lavish gifts for doing well. I think they all got cars for winning the uh, Olympiad. Some oh, of them I remember, yeah, I heard it, yeah, I read it. Yeah, So when you're dealing with authoritarian countries, they're able, because there's no bureaucracy, they just give it. So there's that kind of passage of, okay, great, you've won and they're done. We don't have that. So again, should, could we have that? Probably wouldn't work yeah. because then it would, it's like, okay, that's only for the top few players. What about everyone else? Yeah, it's a, yeah, I get what you're saying. And so, a lot of countries that have done well are in ones that have l limited uh, huge power in the top authority, whether that's a monarchy, unelected leader, whoever it is. No criticism there. They've done a great job pushing checks, but we just don't have that, so we can't do it. In, in, uh, normal, in um, countries similar to us in the Western world of Western Europe and et cetera, it's just the fact of ease of travel. All the countries near them, they have a ton of grandmasters. So, I live in Portugal. Let's let's just assume Portugal has no grandmasters. Well, Spain yeah. has a ton. I could play there, and I, I don't even need to fly there. I could drive. It's it's a, it's a border. It's right there, and the thing is to go from one end of Europe to the other end max is an hour and a half on a flight max. For me to get from Canada to Canada is five hours. Like it's yeah. like if I want to play in Vancouver, it's a huge thing, yeah. and I don't want to play in Vancouver. Like there's a lot of top chess players in Canada who just don't want to travel that far, and. If the tournaments are only in Ontario, if you live in British Columbia, unless you're very wealthy or you have a lot of time off, you don't want to travel there. There's so much risk. So yeah. there's so much. And the thing is, you don't want to travel. You want to stay in your place. And that's yeah. why they have stagnating growth. They, they have this. They have a lot of successful youth kids and then they just dip off. And that's always what's going to happen there because they don't have the strong chess players that travel to Seattle or to Toronto or to anywhere else. So now to mention your question about the candidates, I don't think there's going to be a boom because I see no reason why there would be one. In Iceland, there was nothing. Absolutely, there was basically no chess scene, no notable one, to suddenly explode it because of the great event. In candidates, first of all, I don't know how many people care for it. I don't know how many people even can name most of it. The candidates field is not, doesn't have this, these personalities that we're familiar with with Bobby Fischer having. Not all of them are the top chess players. One of them is going to be Abjad, Abhijat Nabasov, who I don't even think is in the top 100. Again, no criticism to him. Congratulations for yeah. qualifying to the candidates. But you don't have these big names, all these big names. You have some, but not all. Do you think it would have changed a little bit of Magnus? Oh, 100%. 100%. Magnus uh, is chess right now. Yeah. When you don't have Magnus, tournament interest just doesn't exist. Like the Sinkfield Cup, I follow all the big tournaments. I didn't care about the Sinkfield Cup at all. And I would look at the results for draws. I wouldn't even look at the games. Usually I would just like click over them. It's boring. The yeah. thing is, you look at the games, you're bored to death. There's this game, Jan Nepomniachtchi versus Maxime Vichy Lagrov, and it was a draw. And if they repeat it twice, then Jan sacrifices a pawn for absolutely no reason. There's nothing to gain. You just lose a pawn, he repeats now. It's like, okay, congratulations for making the game five moves longer. Yeah. But there's nothing interesting there. The reason why it's interesting with Magnus is because he's so much higher rated than everyone. He's always trying to win. I want to watch that. He's also an interesting personality, whereas a lot of people are just like boring. Yeah. And some people struggle with the English language. Yeah. Even like, for instance, Ali Reza Faruja, who plays exciting chess, for instance, his interviews are not that interesting. And so it's, it, it's a limited appeal. With Magnus, it's, everything is there. Everything is there. Now, Hans Niemann is another example of that. Everything is there. He's a strong chess player for his age, and he has that he, uniqueness when he talks on the microphone. So if Hans was there, definitely that would boost the interest. Now, we could talk about Hans in a different moment, but 
there's many different unique personalities that would work, but of the ones I'm seeing, most of them are, if I, you, maybe not you, but most chess fans could not even name everyone that qualified. Yeah. Because they don't care. They have very, they're very boring. They're stale. Or you're isolated to that one or two person. Which yeah. Is fair. Like, no, fair. Like obviously, Jan, Napomnishi, and Caruana are the top two names everyone thinks of. And probably Ali Reza, it looks like he's going to qualify. But most people. Yeah, I think he actually did qualify. He did qualify. Yeah. It's unclear whether or not they're rated in time. So we'll see after on January 1st. Irregardless, the, the candidates I don't think are going to get a big push. Yeah. Recently, we had the, the Champions Chess Tour being held in Toronto. And that did nothing for chess in Canada. Nothing. And that, they had literally all the top chess players. You had Magnus. Yeah. You had Hikaru, who is obviously another huge personality and big name, exciting chess. You had, Car you had Caruana. You had Ali Reza Faruja. You had um, all these big names. But they did no interviews with outside world. There was no audience. There was no engagement with the Toronto society. I worry about that with the candidates. Everyone's hyping it up saying, oh my God, it's the first time we'll have it. Great. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll watch it. But, you know, my dad watched the Karpov Kasparov matches when they were held in St. Petersburg. Uh, and he, he was only there for, he was only there once. He only watched one game and it ended in a short draw. But I think it was part of their 48 game match that they <laughs> yeah, had. Yeah, so, I, you know, it's very difficult to guess how much the appeal would be. But as I said, without, even though people are going to try to win, because obviously your goal is to qualify to play against Dingley Ren, I don't know what the how big the candidates will be. And Toronto, this only really happened because there's this business magnet who sold poker stars, who has a ton of money, who's uh, who's running this. I I don't know if this is something that we can expect. Now I'm speaking to a lot of Canadian organizers and players who want to do something around the candidates. The Canadian zonals are going to be right before them, but I really. I'm not sure that there's going to be big anything happening there. I mean, why would there be? No, that's interesting. Yeah, like, I, I, I feel as though, and I don't know if this is necessarily a Canadian problem, maybe just in general problem, like, can, our chess is still, like, we, yeah, we have our own Olympiad, we have our, like, we have, like, it's played by over 500 million people in the world, but yet it's still not considered mainstream. It's not like you could turn on, you know, Sports Center, Rogers, ESPN, and see, like, you know, this exciting chess game, because it's really not exciting at the end. Like, for us that are highly interested in the position, yeah, it, we, we could be, like, very, like, oh, wow, like, you know, but for the, the casual viewer, they're just seeing either two people play on the board with, like, poker expressions trying to play a game or if it's online they're just seeing moves that they had really no understanding so look you're absolutely right and uh, we i think kasparov ch and other people try to make chess televised you could do it for blitz and i think chess is moving in the right direction making things faster faster time control i think yeah. that's amazing because i mean for me i want to see the highest quality game i want the games to be as long as possible i don't enjoy people making moves in five seconds in long time controls but if i'm watching blitz rapid i want to enjoy myself yeah commentators are trying to make it sound like it's a some sort of f1 race or some sort of basketball we could talk about commentators in a moment yeah but i i think uh chess is moving in the right direction maybe we can get it televised soon norway televises some of magnus's games because it's magnus yeah well that's supposed to yeah, it's good something. and norway is very limited in the amount, although they've actually they have a few very strong track and field players they're very limited in the amount of elite bases that they have that people just associate with like if you go to norway and you just say name me the most famous person there magnus is going to be one of the most uh, uh one of the top people on the list there's probably going to be a few others but magnus is going to be one of the top ones whereas if you go to Canada or america the yeah, america has no shortage of famous yeah. individuals so to say that Carwana would be up there would be would be a stretch. I mean, even Bobby Fischer, to speak, wasn't even the most famous. He was just everything for Americans. He exemplified Americans. It was at perfect time versus against Cold War, the yeah. Cold War against Soviet Union. He was playing Boris Spassky, part of that Soviet machine, everything. And he was beating all these Soviets to get there. Right? He beat uh, Taimanov and Petrosian in dominating fashion. So there's a lot of interest on that. But since then. That hasn't really existed. If we do television events, if we start doing blitz, I think it's possible. Online blitz or in person? No, I'm, I'm really against online. Yeah. We could talk about that maybe later. We could talk about it now. 
with uh, cheating, with what Kramnik has said and other players. Uh, I think some people have gone overboard. I think it'd be interesting to talk about Kramnik. He's, with Kramnik, when he... said a three-hour interview, I couldn't... No, it was... I just still have a hard time watching through that three-hour, like... Sure. Kram, no, but with Kramnik, he, he repeats himself a lot, and it, it, it's... I want to I want to know the absolute specifics, but it, I think Kramnik said himself that he's available to be interviewed by anyone. Mm, but, is that a hint? <laughs> so that maybe is your future contact, but... Yeah. Uh, look, forgetting about Kramnik, a lot of top chess players are very concerned with cheating online. I personally have played Title Tuesday and I did well. I, I got th tied for third and I got some money. But I know that cheating is a really big issue there. And a lot of top players have already been caught. And kids, not even Hans, but other players that aren't mentioned. So can we, can, let's yeah. talk about cheating because this is, this is a, an interesting topic, um, especially the. The online way, and I'm, and I, I'm kind of. <laughs> this is kind of going against my very nature of like being ethical. But how does one really cheat online? And it sounds easy at first, but with all these like, ain't, like for example, you know the chess.com like it's determined to happen like live. I was there as a as a, a guest with a, an organization, and there was a whole promotion about kids and stuff, and really great time. But they had their very own anti cheat person who has a laptop and I, I met him and he's scanning sound waves like every different type of like wave you can think of, whether it's held with metal or plastic that can okay. bypass any metal detection and he can detect if there's any like program being used within like the hallway to see if there's any sort of like it's like the latest anti-fraud for like chess like over the board but if you're online like to me cheating is not like like you can correct me if I'm wrong but to me, cheating is not finding the best move. It could be like the fourth move, or it could be just some sort of indicator that tells you, oh, by the way, your position is actually winning, not losing, because sometimes we we don't know it's winning or not. Like to me, that's cheating. Like and he's like, and if like someone like gave me like a red dot that told me, and I'm let's say I'm playing here, I'm like, oh, my position is actually equal. I thought I was like minus two or plus two, and it's actually an equal position. Now I can reevaluate more clearly. Like to me, that's scary. Okay, so very important cheating. Any any outside assistant, outside assistance is cheating. Like Duba famously said, I think on stream that if somebody were to just tell him, you know, once or twice a game whether or not his position is good or bad, just with a thumbs up or thumbs down, that would be good enough to get above fifty percent against Magnus in in slow games. Now, I don't know if that's true. The difference between wow. them is a hundred points. Maybe it is. Let's just take it at yeah. face value. Let's say it is. That's. That, that just shows that you don't really need a lot. Like for me to beat a grand, people don't understand, like general people don't understand this. The difference between me and someone starting out is tremendous. So it's very easy to catch, like let's say you're 500. To beat me without <laughs> obvious cheating would be impossible. Yeah. Now a 1900 could beat me with cheating. That could make it quite hidden. But if I'm playing a grandmaster, the difference is so small. It's really concentrating just a few key moments. Like if I, when I look at my grandmaster games, some that I've drawn, some that I've lost in recent memory, some that I've even won, it's really only been just a few moments that I've just changed the game completely. If I was just made aware that, hey, don't do that, kind of like there was this, uh, who wants to be a millionaire? There's a guy who was caught cheating by someone in the audience who was <laughs> yeah, coughing. Yeah, the wife, was yeah, saying, yeah, the yeah, wife yeah. and yeah. someone else who was coughing all the time. If I was just, if that's all that happened, which is, you know, I was considering this, someone coughed, I consider that, did that. Really, that'd be enough for me to become a grandmaster because the difference between me and a grandmaster is so small. It's just the rating seems large, but I can easily beat them in one game with a little bit of help. And if I can beat them, why can't I do that with several other people? And again, I don't need to score nine out of nine. I only need to score six and a half or six or five. Mm -hmm. Whatever that number is, it's much lower than what, in, what, what we initially Or you just need help against someone that's just stronger. And then... Yeah. Then you, and in your favor against the ones. So that are... this ha this happened in a, con a continental <clears throat> chess association. So and the problem is it's difficult to deal with after the fact. So for instance, there was a I don't want to even uh, help the audience here figure out who this is, but there was an individual who played in a tournament I played in many a few years ago, and he was consistently standing up, but he was always near his board. It wasn't like he was leaving the playing hall, and he was beating all these grandmasters. He was performing two hundred points above his rating. He had he got his norm. He secured a norm around prior, so in round eight. So if he finished round eight, he secured the norm. Round nine, the organizers were very suspicious, suspicious of him. They put him in a different room, and he lost instantly. 
like in 20 moves against a grandmaster, I think with the white pieces. There's no indicator because you can't, if I have no proof, there's nothing I can do. Let's say, let's say we play. I'm looking at this from an arbitrary perspective. Yeah, but yeah. let's say we play. You and I play a match. I beat you nine out of nine. Let's say we're the same level. I beat you nine times in a row. Okay, and now everyone thinks it's suspicious. So we put you in a quiet room. No, no sound wave. We make sure everything, and you beat me. There's doesn't not, prove anything. That doesn't prove anything. Now, we, it could raise suspicion. But it, this is kind of like my problem with the Hans thing. The, over, the online thing, the, the initial claim with him w was that his interviews were very weak. Like, if you listen to his interviews, it didn't sound like one of his level. But who yeah. cares? This that, is, that doesn't you, mean you're guilty. You may, yeah, absolutely. There's no, if we have no actual proof of him, like, we could say, he, in my opinion, he acts, like, very bizarrely a lot of times, irregardless of your view of cheating. He, he acts uniquely, maybe is the right word, <laughs> unlike most people. Yeah. But that's not, that's not any way to do yeah. anything with him. And with cheaters, you need to catch them in the act. Like, I remember I heard a story of, of a... Of a girl going to the washroom in the stall and so and she was facing the urinal and she was there facing the urinal for about five minutes and then left no sound of anything happening in the urinal okay well that's not proof of anything yeah do you have a picture of her on her phone no well she went on to beat a grandma i don't care she be what she went on to beat her coach i don't care i heard this this happened in america actually i don't care you don't have proof i don't care that you think she's suspicious there are people now who think, oh, no, they cheat in the past, but they don't cheat anymore. It's like, oh, do you have any proof of what yeah. you're saying? Well, look, they're 12 years old and they've lost 200 points. I'm like, okay, this is just, this is not evidence. This is not evidence of anything. I've lost 101 points. Are you claiming I've cheated? No. Yeah. I know, I, I personally know I haven't. Uh, of course, that's what anyone would say. <laughs> so yeah. it's very difficult to, it's impossible to prove cheating after the fact. In person cheating, I think happens very infrequently because it's huge. Like we're going to talk about online and in person. In person, it's very difficult because if I want to cheat, I need accomplices. And so that must mean forget about me risking my reputation. That mean must mean they're joining the journey of risking their reputation. This happened in France, I think, with the Olympic team members going with hand signals. A lot, quite a few of them got banned and now they're blacklisted from tournaments Jeez, yeah. and they're they've been reinstated by fide i think they fide only gives short bans for this like a few years but they, they're back uh, there's what obviously the famous case is the guy from latvia who was on his phone uh igor raosis yeah sounds he good. he and the funny thing is fide punishes this man by giving him the im title it's like by removing his gm title it's like yeah this doesn't really accomplish anything yeah it, it hurts was, him but it's not he, like uh and he knew he he would purposely play in very weak tournaments where there wasn't high security measures, and he'd go to the washroom. That's incredibly difficult to stop, especially in Canada, because we're playing with... In Canada, it's very difficult, because a lot of people in the winter are wearing coats, yeah, thick coats. I, I played an opponent, I'm not going to mention his name, that people and the arbiter told me that he was... There were suspicions of him cheating while I was playing him. Now, I probably... It would have been better if I didn't know this fact. I went on to lose... Quite, and it Wait, was, you knew this during the game? Yeah, I was, a, I was made aware during the game that my opponent I'm was... I'm sure like, you can't do that. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, and regardless yeah, of yeah. the actual... Yeah, yeah. And parents would come to me. And in any case, I went on to lose. And, and I was just cleanly outplayed. Even my father was under the belief my opponent cheated. And, you know, the phone wasn't there. There was no proof. His phone was off. He went, the reason why I was suspicious is because he kept on going to the washroom every move. But again... We can't prove, and the thing is, I'm always on the side of innocence, unless you can prove it. Like there's a situation with Ryan Campbell, who's this unrated kid, and he played in the Canadian Open in 20, oh, yes. 22, I believe, summer 22. Yeah, that was a big Reddit. Like, and he beat Atanasov, and then he beat Rasmin. And I'm like, yeah. I, and then people were suspicious. They looked at his games. There was he was like there. five for five or something. Like it was He like, was five for five, and then he went on to lose the next four, and they're like, well, that, I'm like, that's not proof of anything. Like, First of all, yeah. you've just psychologically destroyed this pure soul. Like, he, here he is playing his first tournament, now everyone's, like, the whole tournament's accusing him of cheating, and the outside world. It passed through international waves. Like, I remember Dan, Daniel Nerdisky was on his stream analyzing those games. I think, I think we have to be careful accusing people of cheating, uh, because you could, you could easily dissuade them from playing, and I think it's bad to just consistently accuse people of cheating unless you have really good proof. Yeah. And with on, we're going to talk about, I want to talk about online in a second, but in person, unless you, right there, there's a phone or there's this communication. 
there's, there's nothing you can do. Now, ch we've tried to avoid this by having players not be able to speak to each other during games. Very tough to force. It, it's, first of all, it's very difficult to force because in the past, we never have. And so we suddenly we're going to yeah, do it retroactively. Yeah, you change behaviors also. That's, what not if, gonna, what, that's not happening. Yeah, it's hard to be, it's, hard, it's not like they're doing it on purpose. They're just talking. Like there's, there's two very strong chess players that used to go out for smokes. There were strong chess players. One was a GM, one was an IM. And they're talking in Russian. So arbiters have no clue what they're saying. Yeah. And so it's impossible to know whether or not they're helping. They could have actually. There's easily, no doubt in my mind that it's possible. If you told me that they did, I wouldn't be surprised. But there's no proof. There's no proof. And I, you know, I had a, I have one famous story about this that I can tell you. I played in a tournament. I got up from my game. I was in the last round. I had no chance of anything. I was playing someone low raid than me, and someone came up to me. And it was a friend. We we were just talking. He said, "Hey, Mark, why don't you do this?" And I said, "Whoa, you can't do this." And the thing is, that move would have won me the game instantly. My opponent then allows me to make that same move. Am I allowed to make the winning move? And you. It's kind of hard to say no, because who knows if that move would have popped into my head a move later. Now, I didn't ask for it. I was just made aware of it. Funny enough, this individual who told me this would be later banned by the United States Chess Federation uh, as he was caught cheating. And I think he's issued a lifetime ban uh, for cheating. I think FIDE has given him a few year ban, because FIDE only issues a few years. Yeah, you see it's all different. Yeah. And so the thing is, what do you do in that situation? I decided, I mean, I played it and ultimately I won. I think, I, I mean, I was winning in that position. I would have won irregardless of what I would have yeah. done. But uh, yeah, it's just that whole... I, I, I'll never forget it. And it happened like almost 10 years ago. So it's, but it, you know, I'll never forget it. And it, it, it completely worsened my view of it. I think we don't have to say that we're going crazy with anti-cheating. I don't worry about the Sinkfield Cup having strong anti-cheating measures or the Champions Chess Tour. I worry about a local tournament where so, an internet, so for instance, a hard house has no real anti-cheating measures and I could come in, cheat, win and leave. And now the thing is with hard house is even more difficult. It's a little difficult because they, their games are broadcast, but what about games aren't broadcast? Can I ask you just, do you think locally, like specifically with here, do you think cheating is quite significant uh, over the board? I have no reason to believe so. I have no reason to believe so. I've heard few people be as I'm, I've heard the people that I mentioned to be accused of cheating. Yeah, like I'll say, like during my small time in like because I'm I'm in the name Arbiter now, and I think I've done over twenty something events. I've we've maybe suspicious one person was considered suspicious it was like a sixteen year old kid, um, but there was no enough. There was not enough evidence and. Any, other than that, we haven't found anything. No, I mean, there's nothing. I mean, sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a kid in Kitchener years ago when I was when I was like 12 who was going to the washroom <clears throat> during his move. I'm like, well, you know, if he has to go, he has to go. Yeah. We can't stop the man. There's no law saying you can't. What, are we going to force people to urinate in their pants? No. So what do we do? We let them go. And then what if they do it often? Well, you know, what can we do? We're not allowed to bother them during their game. Yeah. So as long as they're not clearly cheating we can't do anything there i i think over the board cheating isn't as frequent because it involves so much risk yeah. and the reward is sometimes so low because let's say i cheat against magnus even and i get away with it the thing i've done apart from bragging rights is i've gained nine eight nine rating points <laughs> that's it so yeah. i have just lost 101 rating points so you're going to tell me i need i'm going to cheat <laughs> Damage my entire chess career, my teaching career, all that for nine rating points. Maybe it's just for the ego, because you know there's ego in chess. Yeah, it's ego in chess. But the thing is, like, nine rating points for chess. Like, yeah, it's not practical. So I, I'm not really too concerned with it. I'm, again, the bigger the prize fund, the bigger anti-cheating there are, should be. I mentioned the Continental Chess Association being very weak. They have no anti-cheating measures, and they have big prize funds. I think we should be worried about that. Now, if you just have a local tournament, it's hard to get, do it. Like we, we can't have everyone have those wands and come in. Like I recently played. There's, there's cell phones on the table. Cell right? phones on the table. Yeah, it's like. Yeah, I mean, I know we ask them to do stuff, but it's really hard. Like I played in Webster, for instance, and they have the scanners. Each person has to walk through it. Very limited people. High prize fund. I think it was limited to fifty or sixty people. That works, but again, this we cannot say this is a standard because. The smart people that are going to cheat are going to cheat at the small tournaments, not the big ones. You know, if Fabio wanted, if a person wants to qualify for the candidates, tough luck. You're not going to get away with it because every tournament you're playing in is going to be very much 
looked at. We're going to look at your behavior. We're going to sympathize with you. We're going to feel bad for you. We're going to look. Why is he in the washroom for so long? Jan Nepomniachtchi was criticized a lot for walking a lot during his game against Dig Loren. Obviously, he wasn't cheating. Dig Loren was sometimes walking. He was accused of that. But it's like people behave in the way they do. Yeah. And we, we as arbiters, we, we don't want to interfere with that. Let people do what they do. Yeah, we don't want to change any potential state of because they're 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 their own uniqueness. They have their own process. But we also want to make sure that there's fair play, and sure. it's up to the organization, the organization, at the, like the T, like the tournament director at the end of the day, to be like, hey, what's the what's the risk? Like, you know, we have a high prize pool, but yeah, anyone locally, it's just it's not feasible. Like, it's not feasible. You, you can't wand everyone. There's no, it's, it's people put their cell phones there. That's probably one of the best. No, we ways we need to it. we need to probably change the rules a little bit, and we need to maybe have harsher, even harsher penalties. Like I had, there was a guy in I think in Montreal, in Quebec, it's not allowed. Where he had his phone in his table, he was forfeited. Now maybe we should just make that. He wasn't aware of that. Obviously, he was phone was off. But we need to be so hold on, let's, transparent. Let's, let's be more specific. Let's break that down. So, are you saying, uh, let's say I'm playing someone and my cell phone goes off? That's a game loss. You want that to be harsher or no? What no. or is so it, no no. So the problem is if your phone is on you, that uh, that should be. So if I place it here, is that considered? I should be. It should, it should be. be. It should be off. It should be on the floor, or not in the room. It so actually should. The rule should be not in the room at all. That we should also start issuing no spectators. Spectators are an issue. Like pre yeah. pre engines, spectators are fine. When Kasparov and Karpov are playing, you can have an audience right there because no person can come up with a better move than what they're going to do, <laughs> yeah, yeah. even if they communicate with each other. <laughs> yeah. So. No, I see what you mean because. Like, if I really wanted to cheat, I would just get a buddy to, like, wink at me from across the room when they right, get right, in my right. position, and I'll be like, oh, I'm... <laughs> yeah, so I, spectators yeah, are so... a big issue. The thing is, in Canada, and in America, there's not a huge deal with we, spectators. I could be a spectator. We don't have an actual specific, like, guideline process for, like, these... Like, at least from my from my standpoint. And I consider myself a, still a newer arbiter that, to, like, identify, like, cheat. And it's weird, because... I I have a background of like security, so that mindset actually works really well to like yeah. focus and see is there any type of irregularities. And usually, what I'll do is I'll I'll look at like if they come with Pete families and families are close by, I always tell the parents like, hey, back off a little bit. It's not necessarily because I know they're interested, but it's because I want that space open so I can see if there's anything going on. Because some sometimes parents are like they like look like this, and I'm like, no, get out of here. Like, yeah, yeah. The thing is, though, most of the time parents are much weaker than their kids, yeah. so the parents. W the only thing point, can do is point. harm them uh, and distract them. Uh, I've seen it when I was younger. Parents would do it. And I'd, I'd be nervous, but I'm like, I knew that their parent didn't play chess. And right. I'd be like 16, 1700. The likelihood that a random parent I've never seen before is going to be stronger than me who hasn't played in years is incredibly low, even at that point. So I'm over the board involves huge risks because the punishments are steep. I just think we need to set a few clear boundaries. Now, people are going to say we need to have spectators to grow the game. Now, maybe there should be spectators behind a glass or something, but we can't yeah, it's But we can't have spectators in general, especially in, in places that have no, uh, what's it called? No real control, no wanding, nothing. Funny enough, uh, the most, <laughs> the best tournaments that can, we control spectators actually kids' tournaments. All the parents we can Yeah, all the parents are on. The kid, obviously, the kids are not going to cheat. <laughs> Uh, they don't. Most of them don't even don't know how. how to, yeah, like, they don't know how. Yeah. They don't know even how to get away with it. So, you know, we just make sure the kids aren't talking to each other during the game, and that's fine. Yeah. But for adult tournaments, I know that people like to spectate. It. There has it's to be. Hard is it's chess is a spectating sport. Chess is spectating, spectating sport. So that, that yeah. we we have to deal with that, but definitely we have to deal with phones. Uh, maybe they all have to be put at the back in a in a certain. Uh, there's there's liability with that too, and not to mention. Like just from my perspective, like there, there would be a liability of like imagine like you take the phones and you have to case them and you have the equipment to do it and what if phones missing? Like, it'll be a real pain. No, I understand, but yeah. so then the liability is on you then to not bring the phone in there in the first place. Which you either risk losing it or you don't bring it. Either like I like the I, I like the I like and this is like the not official program, but like put the phone table face down, turn it off. If it well, goes that's off, what everyone it's, says. It's game loss. No, but that's what everyone says. But the thing is, it's still people are suspicious because it's right there. Uh, for me, I don't. Again, I don't really accuse my people of opponent cheating. If I were to always think my opponent's cheating, it's going to be throw me off my game. Yeah. If if I'm under the impression my opponent's cheating, I just log off. 
funny enough, every time I have a bad set online, like really bad, it's usually because somebody cheated like 10 games ago and then I just tilted and spiraled out of control. It's very rare that I'll, sp I mean, I will spiral out of control sometimes for no I've reason. I've seen some of your streams, yeah. But, I, but from, yeah. from just casual games I'll play online, a lot of times it's because of that. And that actually happened yesterday. Like I was playing really well towards the end. I was, was getting online? really online. I was getting really, well, and I, now I'm uh, having to switch online. And I, you know, I was doing well, getting a bunch of rating and bullet. And then suddenly I'm losing quite a few. And I'm losing more and I'm losing more and it's different people and I'm annoyed and I leave. I lost like 50 points. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I only lost 10, but I, from my peak to the bottom, I lost 50. I wake up to Lee Chess refunding me like 10 rating points. And that's because bad, yeah. that's because someone cheated before. I think there should be no money events online ever because there's nothing you can do. Wow. There's a, any, any, any rule that's being instituted is too weak. And anything can happen from some being just off camera to some to people like obviously head, if you have headphones, as I agree with Kramnik, it's a non-starter. You can't have headphones in. You can't. I mean, we could say we trust this person, but not that. But that's ridiculous. Like it's a non sec You cannot have headphones on because if you do, you are potentially cheating. Now we now we're just going by honor system. Do you believe in the anti-cheats of like these like algorithms that no. detect reporting no. and no. stuff like that? No, I believe in them to a certain extent, but no, no. Obviously, like look, if like you're how, how do you detect the third move, like or like the, the fifth exactly. best move or stuff like exactly. that? Exactly, you There's and no I are talking about like high quality cheating. Yeah. Obviously, the low quality cheating is just picking all the best moves or picking mo top moves most of the time, and that's so obvious. Like, or you could there is there are some people that think they're smart. They play a really bad opening. Where they're minus two, and you know, then they play perfect. Nothing's moves. more inter. I remember there was this game. It was a. Oh, I don't remember the players. It was I was, I was watching it live. It was like one of those like on the board, um, uh, games and like there's like commentary. I think it was a. Uh, it's the female uh, international master from India. She was commentating. Like it was a few years ago, and I remember just I'm just watching this game, and I'm like, oh, it's kind of cool. And then they're like talking about this engine move, and the engine move is like King F8 when it's like a, like 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 a like a like a like a bomb going off in the center. It's like is the engine calculated that you have to like move here because when there's like this combination that's gonna check you down the road, like seven eight moves ahead, like get the king out of the way. So they're talking about oh look that's an engine move like that's very tough like what what is it? they're trying like the IMs are trying to figure out what this move means, and once they finally start to break it down and understand it, they're like. Yeah, there's no way that she's going to... She plays with two moves. Like, it, it, it goes crazy. They're, like, shocked. And it was two moves. Like, the, the one that... Are you thinking moves. this is online or an in-person? This is an in-person. Okay, but in-person is different. Yeah. So in-person is different. Obviously, there's strong players. I don't want to... I don't, I don't yeah. have no commentary on strong... Like, if, if they're really strong, it's going to be really difficult. But... I think it was, like, a 2100 play. Okay, like, yeah, fine. It was, like, it was, like, top engine 3300. Then maybe. Like, then maybe. Yeah, it's it really, was... But, you know, it's really difficult to... Uh, to destroy, you really don't want to destroy somebody based off of one move, no matter yeah. how fantastic that move is. I think she was a, I think she was a cheater. Like I think I can't remember like who it was. That I re, I'm gonna, I wish I can go back and like I need to have names and stuff for to to back it up. But I think it was confirmed that she was cheating. Okay, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I can't speak to this one case, but I really don't think that we can, we should ever destroy someone based off of one move. Yeah, I get. You that. know, one move is too spectacular that nobody can find it. Yeah. Uh, even it just, sometimes it's just luck. luck. They can have their own like, you weird think, mental yeah. thinking and just move yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And, so, but, and then you can say, oh, but in analysis, they said something ridiculous. I don't care. One move is not enough. So, okay, just to get to online cheating, just yeah. to say my thought, I'm interested the to prize, hear yours. The prize pools. The pr I don't think there should be prize at all, ever. For every level? Any level. Because, yeah. okay, I did anti-cheating uh, for the chess map. They, they had the provincials. And I caught so many people cheating. And I... <laughs> I didn't do any algorithms and keep in mind i'm very much on the skeptical side like i want to believe all these yeah. people that they didn't cheat i'm not in the business of destroying people's how did you catch them cheating just well like it's very simple i looked at what their cfc rating was cma ratings and i looked at their games without an engine and i looked at it with it and then i was confused by their moves the wow you were confused i was confused <laughs> Fuck. Sorry, so, no you're good i yeah. i didn't i didn't understand at all what was happening and keep in mind, they're 1100s tops. Some are lower. Like, there was a guy who won grade eight, I think, provincials in Ontario, and his rating was 1100. That is a huge red flag. To win provincials with an 1100 rating in grade eight, you need to be 1800 minimum. 
Now it's like 2,200. Yeah. So to do that with 1,100, all eyes are on you. And he like beat Max Chen, I think, in like 10, 15 moves. It's like, okay, that's it. Like, I, I, <laughs> I'm ready to destroy them on the spot. Okay. But obviously I needed to look at his game. I looked at all of it. And so I, I and I, rem, I, I caught like 15 cheaters. Like wow. That. So, and I confidently did that. And I don't think we got a single one wrong. And keep in mind, we were opening ourselves up to liability because there's stakes. It wasn't like there's no stakes. You get to go to uh, nationals. Do you know how they cheated? Like, Oh, very simple. They had another device or a parent. The worst is the parent because that means that <gasps> yeah. the parent is te- instructing them to do bad things, which means that they're going to, it, it's going to be really there's bad for them. So much up. Wrong in there. There's so much wrong going on. There's no sense of morality. Like the thing is, whenever something suspicious or bad would happen to kids, tournament, like I remember there, I was playing in the under 12 and beside me, the girls under 12 was happening. A girl made a move, let her piece go. And then she took it back. She played a different move. She let it go, took the piece back, and her opponent was kind of confused. And in the midst of that, she made an illegal move with her rook that captured her, her opponent's rook. She starts crying, bawling, being angry, like, what, what is going on here? I remember just being so confused with what was going on on the board. The arbiter said, uh, why are you crying? She said, my opponent cheated. He's like, okay, we'll figure it out after the end of the game. Oh but my. the game ended, and the other arbiter stepped in. He's like, we can't do anything. It's over. And so my dad said, Mark, if you ever do something like that, you're never going to, I'm never going to let you play chess ever again. Holy and I was like, what? Like that ain't, what did even oh come to my, my head? God. Like I remember, I recently, just a funny story, I played against a, ga- a grandmaster, Simeon Cannon, and I played a move that blunders upon. I made the move, and he's in the washer. And I realized that as soon as I let go and hit the clock and I wrote my move down, I realized I blundered upon due to a two move tactic that I thought I could save from, but I didn't. And nobody is around me. And I'm thinking, I, can I, should I, can I bring it back? Can I bring yeah. it back? Can I bring it back? Can I bring it back? And I'm having these yeah. thoughts. Obviously I don't, he comes back and he takes my pot. Funny enough, I end up saving it. So God was on my side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a religious you, man. You were, that was the most tempted temptation you ever yeah. felt in chess. Like he's yeah. not here. There's no one here. Yeah. I just can like, yeah, just bring know, it back. Just mark my move a little bit differently exactly. on, my, on my, on my score sheet and Happens. Exactly, exactly. But you would have to live with it in your head. Exactly. No, I couldn't. And that just would. I couldn't. For some people, they wouldn't care. But for, yeah. So the I thing is, for us, it would so be. when the parent teaches them how to teach or is the uh, is helping them out, it's very painful. Oh jeez. Um, or sometimes they don't get it. Like I, I teach online mainly now, and I have the kids play each other. There's no stakes, so if they cheat, whatever. But I need to teach them like never to do it again. But the parents don't understand. Sometimes they get mad at me. They're like, "Why is this student?" Why is my kid's account banned? I'm like, I didn't do that. <laughs> Leeches. Have you taught kids to cheat? Oh, oh my God. God. Yeah, tons. That's tons. hilarious. Because they're very much in a competitive environment where they're trying to get better. Yeah. And if they can't get there, cheating is a very easy hack. That's the problem. Like, usually people that cheat are the ones that have, like, obviously there's famous examples, but usually the people that cheat are the ones that have failed in their own eyes. They've had set goals and they haven't been able to achieve them. And so they're finding this life hack. It's kind of like they're getting rich. Like you've, you're, you're trying to work hard, you're failing. And so now you have to, you have to do something very unethical, immoral, illegal, yes. steal money from other people, whatever it is. The reason why I'm against cheating online is it's impossible to institute at all at any measures. We could have 18,000 cameras on them. We could, you know, have them face the seal, everything. There's not enough that can make me satisfied. But if you remove the money factor, no, I don't care. Like, Who cares? But then yeah, the song I'm reading. No, but the thing is, people don't think about this. They're like, "Oh, Mark, but you know, I, I get no money, but what if we just have, you know, what if we have all the cameras on them for Title Tuesday, and we're certain that they're not cheating, even if we're certain? But let's say we obviously there's no way to prove. It, but even if we're certain, the problem is the higher rated you are, the easier pairings you get. So you know what I'll do is I'll cheat before get a high rating. And then I'll get comfortable pairings. And so suddenly my chances of getting money is overinflated just because of that. Like my rating in bullet is almost equivalent to Ali Reza's right now. I don't know how that's, but obviously I didn't cheat. There's nothing, there's no reason for me to. But, uh, so in a title Tuesday, that could easily happen. I could cheat just a few hundred points to 3,100. And, you know, I could easily easily much easier now get money than before just because my pairings can be easier because in the first few rounds i'm playing people lower rated than me yeah. rather than the first few rounds i'm playing people higher rated than me wow 
So people don't think about that. They only think, oh my God, Mark, but what if we're certain about title? Two? Fine. But there's, you could cheat before and after that. Leeches now has money tournaments where they have no control. Like I'm saying they have no, they don't control people's uh, webcams or anything. And look, it's as good as you can get. You do algorithmic catches. You, you know, you try to do your best. It's but... almost kind of like a weird publicity stunt in a way. That, you know, we have the highest level of integrity and then we have the best softwares, but... But it's very true? low. It's so low. And the thing is, it's never going to be high enough. No matter what they institute, ever will I be satisfied. Because you cannot stop an individual who is outside of camera view from giving you the move or feeding you a signal or anything. Or let's, what if your internet cuts out? Ding Loren in the in his champions chess tour in 2020, lost internet a bunch of times. Obviously, I'm not accusing him of cheating. He, he lost those games because of internet issues. But what if I lose internet for a minute and I bring it, get it back? Yeah, you just memorized like six lines because you yeah, just yeah, looked at yeah. engine now. Exactly. Now the whole, but now you're like, you got everything no, planned. There, there, you can't have a Germans at all. You, you can't have it. So it's impossible. And I know that uh, if they're very suspicious of you, they put you in a Zoom call. Again, in Title Tuesday, typically, I'm just playing, no Zoom call. I was invited in a Zoom call, and I was I was in a room with other notable grandmasters. I'm not going to mention who they are because they have been caught by Chelsea.com cheating, and they're making noises, like they're coughing or something. It's bothering my concentration. I want to listen to YouTube because that's how I usually get my concentration, and I know I don't want to bother them because I have to have my mic unmuted. It's it won't work. It it takes me off my phone. I lost a few games. I lost two games. I'm like, okay, I'm out. I'm dipping. So it's important. I think honestly. It's impossible. Chess.com is uh, now become a magnet swallowing all these companies, and they're trying to do all these events online. But funnily enough, their biggest event of the year, they did it in person. Yeah. That's not a surprise. And then they said they have all these anti-cheating measures. I don't think Magnus or even Dennis Lazovic is going to be cheating in person. Yeah. Because it's incredibly difficult to. Their, their, their mind is not wrapped that way. It's not like, I mean, the famous theory was they have something in their body parts hiding something that gives them signals. I, even like people on chess players are very basic. They just want to win at the very e simplest level. That's all they want to do. And so it won't surprise me if there's a study that shows that over 50% of people that cheated went to the washroom with a phone. That wouldn't surprise me because that's how most people would cheat. Most people are not getting, most people are not wearing glasses that gives them some sort of feed. Wait until we wait until ten years from now we get chips in our brain. Exactly, it's like a thirty six hundred engine. And no, it's over. Like I yeah. remember, I was playing a bald guy as a grandmaster, and I was winning. And I was throughout the game as I was winning, I was like, maybe he has a chip in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously he did. I went on to lose that funny enough. It was plus four. It was hey, embarrassing. In, in ten years, if, when we have automated cars and we're no, there's no such thing as taxis or anything, because a car will just come to you and. We have all we don't need garages anymore. There's a, ch a chip that will tell you chess. That's gonna. That's no. It's over. It's really over. Yeah. It's really over. And it, that's why we need to have like that blitz rapid. We can. I mean, scanning someone's brain will sound so bizarre, but that's soon what oh, we're gonna have geez. to do. Imagine, no, you know, it's just it's <laughs> instead of like you know in the airport uh, we call it magnetometers. That's like the thing. We're not gonna have magnetometers. We're gonna have the full capsule yeah, exactly. where chess players just like scan, and then it's like gonna detect. No, but all the thing, chips. think about the amount of investment that is. Like most chess Same. tournaments in Canada, yeah. they run neg, net zero or small negatives yeah. or small profits. It will never happen. They yeah. can't invest in these machines, and then usually they don't own this space. So you, the mobility factor of it, like what through elevators, through stairs, are gonna move it. Like yeah, think about it's that. Just, it, like yeah, okay, maybe bring it once is okay. But then imagine always having And the bad guys will always be ahead. Yeah, the bad guys are They will ahead. figure it out. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're cracking the iPhones, they're cracking their... Like, so I don't believe in... Uh, and the thing is, what I just said to you about the rating uh, inflation, to them not cheat in Title Tuesday, people don't think about it. But there's yeah, many, I never thought about that. That's there's so cool. many ways to get ahead. And I, I just gave you very primitive ones that involve no real deep intellect thought into it. It's just, oh, okay, like, here's a way that I can cheat. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, it works. Okay, we talk a lot about. I, I, we got to talk about more positive because this cheating thing is kind of like, oh my god, it's like it's. Totally no, but the thing is, uh, to be honest, I, 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 I'm very up on. I'm very bullish on chess in general. I think we're moving in the right way. Of, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say phasing out standard chess, but I like the fact that a lot of events in Toronto are doing blitz and rapid, because that means that I don't need to sacrifice my weekend. Because before, yeah, I typical. Forget about the hardcore fans, both that are weak and strong. But a typical person is not willing to give up their weekend. Like I, I teach a student who, who's a tech guy. He's, he's doing really well for himself. And he's like, Mark, I don't want to lose my weekend doing this. Like I'll take three buys or something. 
And I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. What kind of tournament is that? He's like, yeah. well, I want to play some games, but I don't want to sacrifice my whole thing. So I think chess clubs are realizing that. Uh, a lot of chess clubs are doing blitz and rapid time controls. It's money efficient. It's time efficient. It makes people happier. The stress is not there because you're, you're, you have a bad event, you're done. What about the chess players that care about rating? Do you think they care about their quick rating compared to their... I think they will player? care about quick rating as quick rating becomes the norm. That makes sense. Because me because personally, right, I don't care about my quick rating. You because don't care I'm now because you don't, yeah. it's not your problem. You just don't play it. But let's say you played it more than you played your than you played the classical. Suddenly you care about that more. There's no reason, honestly, that non-titled players, people that aren't even close to titled, have any reason to care about rating because their rating typically will move up and down very yeah. quickly. Yeah. And so there's no understanding of what their true skill level is. Like I have a, I know a guy who in Hard House got perfect score recently. He gained 150 rating points. What does that even mean? He's definitely not that strength. You can't suddenly be yeah, safe. The stars of all his opponents suck, or he just knew he was yeah. prep ready. So some, yeah. yeah, no, and you know, I talked to his opponents and they're like, yeah, the games were close. So suddenly you're 50 points higher rated than them. Now you're 200 points higher rated than them. You can win five coin flips. It's... Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's my point, right? So that's why the reason the reason why people care about rating as you get higher because it becomes very difficult to get each and every rating point. Yes. Like I lost 101 rating points over the span of three years. It wasn't like I played one bad tournament and lost it all. You look at the worst tournaments, bad tournaments that people play in, title players, grandmasters, they're not losing... 100 points, 200 points. That's not happening. If you're looking at low rated players, it's all over the place. So things that things that fluctuate so heavily, I wouldn't really focus on. But obviously, if you're going to focus on rating, you're going to focus on classical because that's the only thing you play. But if you were only to play rapid, that's the only thing you'd look at. I know there's an IM that studies at the mm -hmm. University of Toronto. He mainly plays that. He, I think he's only played two classical tournaments. He mainly plays rapid. Now, I don't think he really cares about his Canadian rating at all. But if he were to care about one, it would be about the rapid one, because that's the one he plays yeah, most I, of I think I might have played him, actually. Adivate Patel, yeah. He's a strong yeah. player. So so I think we sh I think it's great that we're moving into it, because it's going to be accessible for all. Now, it's fun to watch. Rapid. It's fun to watch. Yeah. And I know the old geezers are like, yeah, but we want the long-time controls. The long-time controls are there. The zonals are happening soon, the Canadian Chess Championships, which is going to be right before the candidates. And they're going to do 90 minutes plus 30 seconds. And then after move... 40, I think they're going to add another 30 minutes. So yeah, old standard, yeah, yeah. So plenty of time. It's like basically a typical game is going to take four hours minimum. So plenty of time, plenty. So people can be very happy playing those games that love the long time control. But I think the audience really cares about the shorter time controls. And, and you could easily pack it in. Like we, I'll give you an example. Hard House had a Blitz and Rapid event and they did Blitz and then Rapid and they sold out the room. They. They could have sold out more rooms if they wanted to. Now, they purposely booked a smaller space, but they could have even booked a bigger one, easily sold it out. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more effective because the amount of control they have to do is much lower. The amount of seriousness people take, seriousness people take is much lower. The stress is lower. So people losing their minds on you is lower. Should we be running uh, quick rapid rings or blitz rings for kids? Or should we keep I think it? I do. Like when I, I've only run one tournament, and it was a rapid one. Again, kids don't think. Like, if you go to any tournament ever that you play in, the one the longest games are the open section, almost always. Now, obviously, you have the games that end shortly, but if even if I play one of the best players in the world, I'm not going to lose in 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm going to lose in hours. Now, they're going to beat me, no doubt. They're going to play me. And maybe I'll blunder early on, but they will. it will take time. Whereas even if you look at two people closely in level that are 1,200s, they will finish way before we do. Because they're not contemplating all the thoughts that are coming to our head. Like, yeah. Let's say there's a position. I'm thinking about 10 different moves. They're only thinking about one. Actually, I'm glad you're talking about it. Because you're actually transitioning to what I wanted to talk about, which is uh, uh, ratings in general. Because um, I know you teach and I teach. And you have a... Like, what is your lowest rated student and your highest rated student? Like, what's your range? Right so now? I teach a lot of group lessons. So I, I teach yeah. my weakest group lesson student, you know, Lee Chess Blitz would be in the 900 range. Mm -hmm. Strongest Lee Chess Blitz would be 2200 range in the Lee Chess uh, for my group students. Oh, for nice. privates, for privates, I'm teaching half adults, half kids. My, my strongest student is 2100 feet. So it's very wow. That's strong. That's as strong as I want him to be because the closer he gets to me, the less I can really teach him. Yeah, yeah. And you know, my lowest, my my typical student, my lowest is very low, but my typical student is you know maybe something in the fourteen fifteen hundred Canadian rating mm -hmm. range, CFC. So let me 
this will be uh, probably really good advice for the audience because um, one of the biggest themes all the time I see on Reddit or talk to people is like, how do we get better in chess? And you know, sometimes like coaching is just not feasible because there's money involved, or maybe they just want like a quick fix, which there never is. But sometimes they want to dream up of it. Um, I remember I uh, I made a, a YouTube series. Like, this was like four years ago when I started uh, this channel. On I call it like the heart of chess, but I explained like the difference between like an 800 and 1100, 1100 or 1400, and then so and so, and like all the different breakdowns. If you were to give advice to, let's start with anyone below a thousand, like three points, and then break down a thousand to like maybe 1400, and then like 1400 to like 1600, like what would you recommend for each of those ratings? Um, and you can go as thorough as you want or just the very specifics, just to give like. You got it from a competitive person. Okay, Just... so very important. I, I wanted to start by sharing this anecdote and then I want to answer your question yeah, about yeah. each level. I had a student who's, I think I told you this last time we spoke, I, I have this guy who's in tech, very, very big guy. He's making a lot of money, making millions of dollars. And months before he met me, six months before he met me, he, he's from San Francisco. So he would buy, he bought every chessable course there was. Yes, yes. And he bought a few chess books. And he was under the impression that that's all he needed. So he reviewed all of them. Not to, but he reviewed them. He started playing and his rating didn't really change. And again, for him, I don't know, he invested, he's told me $10,000. For him, the $10,000 isn't mu worth much. To us, it's insane. Yeah. But for him, it was like, whatever, like he's making millions. And so he's like, whatever, this money is meaningless to me. But it's still like, if you're gonna put some money in, you expect some return, right? Very simple. Like if I put money in a gym membership and I do so, I expect to look a little bit better. If I put money into this, I expect it to, to pay off as somewhat. But he wasn't getting that. So he was getting very frustrated. And so eventually he quit. Six months later, he came, he decided to give it another shot and he messaged me. And since then, he's gained 500 rating points with me in the span of a few months. No credit to me. I literally, I was, as I, I think I told you before, I really didn't, I barely taught him any chess. I was barely, basically his therapist. Clearly, his mind was warped incorrectly. So, to answer your question, ultimately, regardless of level, if you don't play, you won't improve. Any sport you play, if all I do is, I, let's say, I shoot hoops, just practice my uh, form, I will be a horrible player if I'm not on the court. Like, for instance, when it comes to basketball, my father shoots way better than I do. But I will, I'm much better at basketball than him. Because basketball involves many different aspects, not just that one thing. Mm -hmm. Same with chess. Let's say all you do is tactics. Well, fantastic. You're a great tactician. What about your openings? <laughs> what about your strategy, positional? What about your end games? That's, it's not good enough. You need to make sure that you, you, you have ev all your bases covered and then you're ready to play. You see your mistake? You learn from that. I recommend self-analysis over computer lines. Because yes. what I say is when you turn on the computer, you turn off your brain. Why is that? Well, because when you turn on the computer, all you're doing is you know that the computer is right every time. Because we live in a world now where engines are always right. So you're just convincing yourself that, yeah, that's what you were thinking. Even though you weren't thinking that. Or if you were, it was for the wrong reason. So you want to make sure that you have the analysis on your own prior to doing it with a coach or anyone else. You want to make sure you have the reflections first. Like, for instance, it's always stupid. Like, I'll teach a student and we're analyzing their game. They would have analyzed with an engine already. I, there's nothing I can say to them because they've already seen it all. So my input is nearly useless. So what I do though, is I try to give general advice about some specific moment that they had. So let's say they allowed a check that attacked their king that would eventually lead to them getting mated. I would say, well, we should really rethink our idea of king safety. And then we, maybe we do a lesson <coughs> on king safety mm -hmm. because I, and I can't give them specific advice because they already looked at the engine and their mind is warped. Their mind is actually not poisoned because they, they are convinced that the engine is absolutely right about this and there's no way that anything else, any other idea works. The advantage of my old coach, the reason why I liked Ochkus is he wasn't afraid to be wrong. He was just giving me ideas to consider. The re I think my big advantage in chess as a player is I have many ideas. Now, a lot of them are really bad, but I never ever get in positions where I'm like, I have no idea what to do. You yourself creative? Uh, very, very much so. Now, it's very much to my detriment a lot of times because I think there's always a chance to push, even though sometimes it's absolute zeros, just take the draw. Yeah. But I always try to create something in the position. People always say they can never expect my moves, and I like that, regardless of whether I am good, well, in a good we direction. Fall, we're humans that fall prey to patterns. 
Yeah. If you can break the pattern, you can yeah. screw people up. Exactly. And so I'm very, very much uh, happy to do so. So going back to the question of uh, improvement for players, nothing is more important than playing. Let's say you have five hours a week of chess. Let's say you d say, okay, I'm going to give myself five hours. Half of it should be playing. So that's two and a half minimum. Now, what, what does it matter? What type of time are you playing? Well, it's... typically people that want to get better, they intrinsically understand. And what I'm going to say is not too surprising. You don't want to play shorter, short time controls. The shorter, the, the, the less fruitful it is. But obviously you don't want to play long, incredibly long time controls because you don't want to just burn 20 minutes of your time attention or 30. Tough or, computer, right? it's it might be, I feel like no, attention span is not there. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I recommend long blitz, short, rapid, something in that 5, 10, 15 minute range. But once you get beyond that, you're either taking it more seriously than your opponent or vice versa. When I'm playing over the board, I'm taking it usually as seriously as my opponent is typically hmm. whereas i'm online you know i'm doing many things i'm on youtube yeah, i'm on yeah. facebook 16 things going on 16 things yeah. 16 tabs open i'm doing open heart surgery over here <laughs> i'm doing everything yeah. so it's not you know i'm not taking it too seriously when i play a lot of times it's just a detox just to like relax myself for through the day like even now like i'm trying to play a little bit more seriously but even then i'll like listen to some podcasts at the back where uh, you know maybe or I'm messaging good beats. Up. Yes, a good beats. Or are you right? talking to your Twitch audience? Yeah, Twitch. Yeah, sure. We could talk about that in a moment. Yeah. And you know, there's I'm doing many a few a few different things, but really I'm just viewing it as practice. So if you're playing online, you should view it as practice for the real in, over the board experience. And so you should treat it as such. You should not be afraid to test out any openings. Don't go for the absolute highest rating. Don't be afraid to lose on time, because it doesn't mean anything to you. Your online should just be preparation for what you do over the board your goal should become a great online player there's no there's people that are much weaker than me over the board that are about you know let's say five six hundred points weaker than me but in online their ratings are right adjacent to mine or conversely i am high rated than a, quite a few grandmasters i'm not better than them and my online ratings don't mean anything yeah. like I have ratings on Lee Chess that is greater than most GMs in every single, <laughs> in every single, from Blitz to Blitz. I like, but that it doesn't mean anything. I know that. Like, I'm higher rated than 26, 2700 feet days. I know I'm not their level, and I'm not here to lie to myself. So you should, whatever your level is, you should aim for in person. Whether that's whether you're aiming for in person classical rapid, that's your or Blitz, that's your decision. But you should really aim for seeing that this is preparation for that. You want to try a new opening? Great. Play it out with the minimal knowledge you have. So that way you can learn it as you go rather than memorizing. People typically learn way better from practices something than memorizing something. Let's say you have a chessable course. Fine. You learn a few concepts, you play. Then it turns out that what you're playing is covered in a course but you haven't gone there yet. You will learn it on your own. And then you could go there and you could see how you could have made improvements. That's how it goes. That's how improvement goes. Don't just do everything off memorization. Chess is an intuitive game, not a memorization-based game. I highly recommend not purchasing all these courses because all the nuance, all the technique, all the fundamentals are taught in the classics, books. Now, you could Google best chess books of all time, and that's going to be the books I'm going to mention to you right now. Mm -hmm. From Middle Game from Max Avey, which is rarely mentioned, or Defense by Lev Pulgayevsky. I really like those. Now, every, if you ask players, they're always going to say, 1953, the Zurich Candidates by Bronstein, or the Endgame Manual by Dvoretsky, or the Analytical Manual, or the Agar. I like Manual Lasker's uh, Manual. That's or Lasker's Manual, or Yusupov's uh, books. I've read them all. I, I surely, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not here to not recommend them. Um, and the great thing about books is you don't have to read in order. When you're reading a chess yes. book, don't. Every chapter is its own book. Don't think that you have to go chapter one, two, three, four, five. I'll read a book and sometimes I'll only read 70% of it or 20 because I'm like, okay, I don't care about this section. I already, I'm confident in it or whatever. And then I can read that. So for Dvoretsky's manual, I have gone through that book maybe five times in my life from cover to cover, but I've never gone through every single position. What I do instead is I look at what I think is the most important positions and he indicates them himself. So it makes my life super simple. I'm like, okay, I'm going to look at these that grabs that concept. Fantastic. Let me move on to the next one. So for students of regardless of skill level, they need to understand a few things. Your engine is typically not your friend. Now, what you could do is after you've analyzed it thoroughly on your own and you've made notes, then you could turn it on and see if you've 
if yes. there's any big disagreements. Yeah. But typically, your engine should not be your friend. Your engine is not there to help you because it should you, be an asset, but not as your main tool for like. Yeah. yeah. Because otherwise, you're not really thinking for yourself at all. To get better at chess, all the all the thought process has to occur in your head. If it's not there, you, I'm sorry, you're not going to get much better. Don't view. Don't think that just because you put this much effort, you're going to see these results. It's kind of again shooting hoops. If I make, if I shoot hoops for ten days in a row, I'm not suddenly becoming Steph Curry. That's the same logic in chess. Just because I study chess for five hours in one day, that doesn't mean I'm becoming Gary Kasparov. Be reasonable with yourself. Set reasonable expectations. Set long-term plans, not short-term ones, because your short-term ones are in, unpredictable. You they you have no way of understanding of where they're going to go. How much uh, tactics training do you recommend someone? Great. So when we're talking about time, I, I want to say 50% of it playing, about uh, 10 or 15% analyzing it. And then we're left with 35. So I would say half of that. So let's say 15, 20% should be doing tactics. Chess Tempo, Lee Chess, Chess.com, I really don't care. They're all the same. Just doing tactics. Again, everything I'm mentioning are resources you could do for free. Yeah. So don't think that chess is some expensive game that you need to invest a lot of money into. Mm -hmm. That's a mistake a lot of people make, kind of like that millionaire I told you about. Don't think that, oh my God, I'm in this game that involved. First of all, a chess piece is clock and everything. You could buy for $50. But it's all sales. It's like, hey, if you go to this course, you suddenly know this whole opening right, right. inside. So out. you have to be aware of that. Yeah. It's kind of like, again, I can, I can purchase very expensive boot camps for any sport or anything that are going to be very non-helpful. Now, I went to one when I was a kid, but my main point was actually not to get better at basketball, was to make friends, and I did. And I viewed it as such. Yeah. I mean, I got better at basketball, but that wasn't the main objective. I wanted it to social experience, to try something new, to see if I liked there's it. A, there's like a basketball uh, court all the way down there. Oh, so great. Yeah, I can see that later. Yeah, I can see that later, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, my point is that when you're playing, you want to make sure you set the right goals. And uh, when, you're set, when, you're doing tech, when you're doing all this stuff, you it, does, it doesn't even be an expensive feat at all. Now, playing in Canada is also incredibly cheap. You just sign up for a tournament and you play. You just, you, or if you don't even have the money to play, you can go to chess clubs for free, like Hard House Chess Club. You can just come in and play. Yeah. I'm willing to play you. And there's 20 different types of me's of all different levels that are happy to play you. Just come in, say, hey, I want to play. People will come and play you. You could do it for free in person if you care. You want to put a clock, you could have a clock there. You want to do a tournament setting, you can do that. You want to do rapid, you have that. Toronto is booming right now. People are claiming that our market is now oversaturated. I think it, we need more. Well, okay, so different arguments. But my yeah. point is that people have plenty of options now to play. And so do it. Find the right place for you. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um... I was I was looking at uh, I was thinking about training myself like because I I'm like I hit 1900 I kind of I know that I'm a little I feel like I'm a little bit stronger but then there's like areas that I want to work on etc and then at the end of the day I have to remind myself that I, have to, I still have to play a game because if you that's the only way you're gonna be able to test all your abilities from you know front to end all the different uh, aspects and like you know even me like I I want to. Like, I don't know if I would have that drive to, like... I remember there was, like, a time when I was, like, in my late 20s. I'm like, I want to be a 2100. Or I want to be a 20. I want to get that that nice little NM. And not even because I want the NM. Sure. I just want to be able to play Title Tuesdays and just be, like, yeah. get my, my butt smashed by, like, everybody and get a draw off an eye one day and just be like... Yeah, I got so, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and you know what? To me, that's fun. I don't have to take it, like, super serious. But I, I, I like that great point that, at the end of the day, online is really fun, but... It's all in rated. It's like it means nothing compared to like over the board, whether it's quicker. You know, I, I'm I'm glad that you talked about quick rapid because I really, um, I mean, I'm seeing a little bit more. Like I check chess.com events and everything. You know, I listen to you. I, I do my I do the four sweeps. I do the 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 chess talks websites. I do the CFC website. I look at news. And I yeah. always look at news. I'm, I always have to be educated what's going on, and then I always look at events. And I want to see what's popping up right now. What's interesting? That's why I saw the new market. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I'm, Maybe I want to try that one. Um, but yeah, we still have a lot of classical, but there's more qu quick rapids that are just coming up and more for adults too. So glad I want to see more of those. And I think, I think it's something that we expect. As I said, people are, are, especially with everyone moving online, people are starting to really value their time and they're realizing that. People that pre-COVID, they didn't realize how much money and time they were wasting from 
commuting into and out of work to lunch to yeah. all this stuff whereas now i'm home not even me a typical person is home they grab a quick bite while they're working finish and now they can be with their family that's it whereas before it's like okay i need to finish work then i have to pick up him then i have to pick up that whereas there it's like okay pick up him both and i come back like you the the, the amount of time the, the amount of time more than money the amount of time that is saved is immense i think there were even some articles that said that people spent over 200 dollars week on food that are just commuted, yeah, commuted. That's... and so now you save 200 that is like, yeah oh my God. and so the, but you know so if you're playing a rapid you, you basically have your day like for instance the, the one in new market you're mentioning it's going to start early in the morning if you get raps, four rounds in one yeah, day that's exciting rounds, and you finish and it keep in mind it's like an 55 plus five so it's yeah. like a serious long game and then you finish at like 4 p.m and you still have half the day to that's yourself amazing. so that's why people like that you have you still can focus on your hobbies and play that's why you're seeing chess clubs do really well like the annex chess club or yeah. the misaga chess club or your chess club the uh, the one in tobacco or many other ones is because people say okay great i have three hours that i'm willing to burn i'm going to do this and then that's it i'm down for chess for the week and really? most people are like that most people are not like okay i want to play chess for the whole weekend like that's there's not i'm like that, right? <laughs> i'm that yeah. you might be that but most people are not yeah no, uh, I, I I have a I, I will give a plug to the Mississauga Chess Club. I do have a soft spot for them because it was the first time uh, it was my first chess club, and I remember I don't remember any names, but I remember I came in and I was like I was like I think I was like nineteen hundred strength in that because I uh, I come in with my dad. My dad was the biggest supporter for me in chess. He's the one who taught me chess when I was four. He was there when I won the first tournament. Oh yeah, so I actually went sideways. Uh, I asked you uh, what was your top moment. Like you can never get back. My top moment, age of fifteen, playing my first tournament, winning it. First time ever, and more importantly, it wasn't even the win. It was like I came. I was five out of six, four wins, two draws. Like I smashed like every thirteen, fourteen hundred player, and I had no rate. I was coming in unrated, and I had no, I had no real test to know like who was stronger. I just won. But it was to see my dad's face when I said, Dad, I won. And he just, like, gave me a hug. And, oh, I will never forget that that moment because not just for the winning, but just to show my dad that, hey, you know, thank you for, you know, taking me out. I know all the sacrifices. At the time, I didn't think of sacrifice, but thank you yeah. for taking me out there. And he changed my whole life because of just introducing the game to me of chess and keeping me motivated. And I remember he couldn't beat me anymore, like, at seven, but... He would still like motivate me but you know he wasn't educated in chess so he didn't have those resources to know like oh there's like because i got invited to uh, canada uh, uh so I, I came second to provincial high schools i lost to like an 11 year old that he was trained by a gm and he smoked it's actually online he smoked me it was like it was tough but i got invited to the uh um the can open and i didn't i didn't take it because i just didn't know enough about it or anything like that so there was a lack of chess knowledge which i i know it's changed now but uh yeah, that that was a really uh, key moment. Uh, but yeah, Mississauga Chess Club. I remember I came in and they're like, "Oh, you play chess?" I'm like, "Yeah, I play chess." I'm like, "Oh, uh, how strong you are?" I'm like, "I think I'm like 18, 1900." He's like, "Oh, okay, let me play you and uh, see how you do." It. I play him. He's like 1970, like I think Fide, and uh, I get a draw off him. He's like, "He'll do just fine." He's like, yeah, the and I was like, it was, I I had five hours of uh, Arendelle College, University of Toronto, and oh boy. <laughs> I was so obsessed with chess those days. I remember I would come an hour and a half early to have to for Mississauga, not for the club, because I would go into the library where they have fiber optic internet that no other like place had, and then I would play on Yahoo games called the Social Lunge, and no, oh, sorry, there was like there was like Social Lunges, and then there was something called Advanced Lunge One, and Advanced Lunge One was every serious bullet player online in Yahoo played. Table one, and it was like a rotating table, and in order for you to sit, like pretend like you and I are like digital, and you kick my butt, and I have to sit out, and then you have every there's like sixteen twenty two hundreds with trying to click in, and at home when I had fifty six k connection, I would never be able to get that. in, and then the one time I get in, you know it's so hard because I can play them out, I can slowly outplay them, but I'll lose on time because I'm not fast. Not, not at Arendelle College. I just click instantly, sit there, go into like a 6-3, like get my butt kicked by a 2300. I don't even know what those were, but yeah, that was, those were such like precious times. And like, 
University of Toronto. Thank you, Arendale College, for not kicking me out of your school and using your internet. I guess it helped because I went to the chess club after. Right. But yeah, I did a lot of volunteering. I remember I volunteered with kids. And I think that was my first taste of like volunteering. Not even just in chess, but in general. And that helped me in life to I love volunteering. I love giving, you know, back because you know, we're all privileged and everything and yeah, that just, those are all fond memories of you know, I, I, I came to Massage Chess Club probably a, a month and a half ago just to see everything. Obviously, it's a little bit different now. It's just kids, like super strong kids. And, you know, my good friend Riley's there. Shout out to Riley. Uh, he's like a, a really big asset to Massage Chess Club. Is or, he going to be at the is he out of Yes, he, he is. He doesn't know you're coming, though, so okay. it's going to be a great time. But uh, I wanted to end with this final uh, question. Um, I'm a big fan of Immortal Games. My favorite chess book is Top 50 Grandmasters of All Time. Right. And from there, I got to learn about the different personalities. Like, you know, Kasparov is like famous, like, you know, Rook Sack that yeah, should have went wrong, but he, he did it. And that's the beauty of chess, right? Uh, but, you know, I got to learn, I got to fall in love with Capablanca games. Oh, so dominant, like, like just, like just intuitively precise, especially Endgame. That's, I fell in love with Endgames because of him. Yep. And I didn't think I need to, I always consider my Endgames the strongest. Now it's, I don't practice enough, so it's something like you gotta like get back into. But I want to know about your immortal game to, to finish this off. What okay. is what is the one? Oh, I don't know if I'm the right. You know, we have a board here. You guys can't see it, but uh, hopefully it was white or you. Or yeah, I was white. I was white. Okay, good. So I want to know your immortal game where it's like. Well, here's the context. I was yeah. uh, playing in Oakville, and it's 2019, so it's on my path to getting the iron title. I was get, I already had two norms, and I was playing. Fellow Canadian, a friend, his name is Mike Ivanov. And it's really one of the best games I've ever played. The one thing I want to do before I show you this game is I want to say that, I mean, you mentioned, look, you mentioned your father. And for me, I wouldn't have even started playing chess if it wasn't for him. Forget about the fact that he taught me every time I travel is with him. World Youths, Canadian tournaments, it's with him. Even now, like that's how we kind of keep our bond. Like that's, it's chess. It's Our relationship is different than the ones he has with his daughters or the ones that I have with my mom just because we've spent so much time together just purely on chess tournaments funny enough most people I've, everyone in the canadian chess scene know, knows who my dad is i but played, no, him recently, you played two him recently but <laughs> my, most people don't know who my mom is ever because she never comes because you know i'm always with my dad and so because of that like my father and i very close bond he taught me how to play and every tournament i'd ever play and he's always there uh with me especially through my, the losses making sure to notify me that i play for <laughs> So here I am, I'm like 2350, and I had started hot. I think I have, what is it, one half out of two or two and a half out of three, and I'm paired against Ivanov, Mike Ivanov. And yeah, I think it was two and a half out of three. So I, some way I played, like with white, I play many pieces and I many different openings. I played C4. This move is very flexible. There's many different options. It's one of my favorite openings. Yes, it's very flexible. There's not much to know. Ivanov responds with E5. Yeah. And funny enough, Mike is actually a colleague of mine. He and I work for the same company. We both teach for the same company. Mm -hmm. He's now trying hard to get his IM title. He has four norms, but he doesn't have the rating. So he's now, I think, in Sweden or something. Holy trying to get. Jeez, imagine having four norms. Yeah. Like, wow. So, okay, so I played knight c3. Yeah. He plays knight f6. I played knight f3, and he plays knight c6. So we have the four knights, but okay, I have the pawn on c4. He has a pawn e5. There's many different options here. D3, E3, A3, G3. And Magnus had recently brought a new idea, which is the movie E4. Yeah, that's I've been slowly like playing that online to see if I can get used to that with chess. Because it actually reminds me of like low key of my Maroxy bind structure. It's, it's almost like a Maroxy. In fact, this opening will lead to a Maroxy bind structure. Now, typically with the Maroxy bind, there's a pot on C5, not the pot on E5. Yeah. But the main idea behind this opening is, look, if they bring out their bishop to c5, which is the most natural square, I always teach my students, put bishops on open diagonals hitting the center. The problem is the very classic sacrifice. I can take the pawn on e5, and when the knight takes back on e5, I have this fork on d4. Mm -hmm. It seems like, at best, when the bishop moves back, I take the knight he takes back. I've regained material, and that's it. But what I've done in the process is I've opened up my dark square bishop on c1, and so it has a bunch of squares here. And what a lot of people think is in, when I take on e5, that they're able to take on f2, saying, okay, after king f2, knight e5, and white's king is not castled. But I'm able to go d4. Yes. I get the full center control. Yeah. 
e5 is coming next. I mean, this one check with knight g4, I can go king g1. The knight will be kicked out with bishop e2. I'm also threatening e5, hitting the knight on f6. h3 is a move. And I just have a huge spatial advantage. My king is not necessarily weak. I don't really need to be worried about my rook being locked in. I need to worry about developing my manu pieces first. Mm -hmm. So going back to the position with the four knights, after I play the move e4, Bishop b4 is now a move that I think most people play. It's considered the move that gives equality. Uh, but Mike plays move g6 oh. after a long thought. And so the idea is simple. He wants after d4, ed, knight takes, to be able to go bishop g7. He wants to think out of that bishop. This literally is Baroxy. <laughs> this is Baroxy. Usually the pawn is on e7, not c7. Okay, so I play bishop e3. Plays d6. Try, he's trying to jump that knight into g4. Okay, I, I, of course, I have many options here. So I play the move f3. So just getting that to Kumaroxi, he castles. And I play queen d2. You would never think they start off as an English. No, you wouldn't. Although Eng a lot of English openings typically down transpose to what we... This looks a lot like those King's Indian setups. Now, I could have taken the knight. He plays something. He, there's many... You can get away with many different moves here. And in the game, he plays the move bishop d7. I play bishop e2. Again, I'm kind of flexible as to where I castle. Um, and he has many choices here. I think he could play rook e8. You have knight e5. You could go a6. And basically, all I'm showing, everything I'm showing uh, transposes one line to another. And okay, you have this typical setup. So he goes knight e5, castle. So why queen side at this time? I could have castled king side, but I felt yeah. like I wanted to start a king side attack. Yeah. And so I, that's why I did this. Plays a6. Play g4. Almost like a, now a Sicilian dragon. Yeah, b5. One of my old favorite openings of all time. We're both going at each other's throats here. He even, at one point, the rookie eight, h5. This is the typical structure. He plays the move c5. Played knight c2. He played b4, hitting my knight. Yeah. So I played knight d5, centralizing it. And now he plays a move that... You know, I didn't really foresee. And this is where the game starts becoming interesting. Obviously, it's already quite interesting. I have the structure e4, f3, g4, h5 on the king side. Yeah. And obviously, he has this d6, c5, b4, a6 pawns ready to attack on the queen side. He goes knight e takes g4. That's seen in some dragon line. Yeah, the idea is after f takes, you're absolutely right, that when the knight comes to e4, the bishop lines up. And obviously, there's many reasons to be scared. Before I even capture his knight, I say, wait a second, let's just take the pawn on g6 so I can open my rook. It could be useful yeah. further. He takes back with the h pawn. And so I take f takes g4. No fear. Knight e4. I have to. Yeah. And now I play. I could have brought my queen to d3, but I thought, okay, I'm going to play queen e1. Now I have maybe the idea of entering through the H-file. And potentially getting rid of this queen because there's all the yeah. attacking potential going down. Luckily for me, funny enough you mentioned that, he just ignores and he goes straight for my king. He goes queen a5. So now he's throwing them a pawn to then mate me, so I have to defend. Yeah. Plays rook b8. Or does he actually... I want to make sure I get the move right. Yeah, he plays bishop a4 first, mm -hmm. trying to get rid of the knight. So I play rook d3. Trying to defend. So if he takes my knight, I'm thinking, okay, if he takes the pawn on a2, maybe I have rook b3 kind of closing everything in so I can focus on the yeah. on the king side. Plays rook b8. And so I say, okay, this is all too scary. I have to just start my own thing. So I play queen h4. Goes knight c3. I take. Takes. Check. Yeah. Oh, king a1. I plays bishop here. Now I'm really nervous because he's starting me. Yes. But luckily for me, I have a mate in 11. No way. You calculate a mate in 11? The advantage of having such positions is you're forced to do so. So I go queen h7. King f8. You should let me try to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not going to. Queen takes g7 check. King takes g7. Bishop h6. So this is all obvious. And yeah. the thing is... I played this in 30 seconds. A lot of people ask me, like, how did you sack your... It was like my only option. I'm getting mated. Yeah, you got, you, there's no other way. If he moves his king to g8 or to h7, it's the same thing. I go knight f6 check, king h8, and now I can move my bishop to f8 and yeah, it's checkmate. Yeah. If he goes to h7, it's the same check with bishop f8 mate again. Mm -hmm. 
So he plays king h8, go bishop g5. Now my idea is if he goes king g7, I go bishop f6, yeah. and then it's back rank mate on h8. Yeah. So he plays him with king g8, knight f6 check, king f8, rook h8. Now he doesn't want to lose that rook with the discovery, so he goes king g7, rook h7, and he believes that I at least have a, I have a perpetual. And so I'm satisfied with that. But then I realize, okay, worst case, I have a perpetual with knight d7, knight f6. But I realize, okay, I can go bishop f6 check, bishop h6 check. He goes king e7. Oh! So I play rook e3. Oh my god! If he takes the knight on f6, it's a maiden two. And I saw this from afar, and I thought that at best I have a perpetual with bishop h g7, bishop h6. But then I realized yeah, g5, g5, and then rook f7 is checkmate. Oh my god! So. He, oh my god. He plays king d8. Yeah, I take his yeah, rook. Yeah, I saw that. And then rook I take this pawn. And he plays king. He, if he plays king b6, I take the rook with check. So he plays king c6. Yeah, so I go bishop f3, g. Yeah. And now. Checkmate. Oh my god. Now I didn't see this. I took on d5. And here, funny enough, I don't have one maiden one. I have five maiden <laughs> ones. Don't worry, this bishop will be on the screen. Right. But oh bishop my. f8, oh rook e6, rook d7, and knight e4. Wow, wow. That is the, one of the greatest games I have ever played in my life. Wow. And you're like staring down a barrel of main and one. You're yeah. like, I gotta keep checking this yeah. guy. What? It's one of those like fun, like, this. you should submit this on chess.com as like a 3300 tactic. <laughs> make them find like made in 11 straight the or, any, any, or the, the chest they yeah or the chest whatever the advantage of these kind of positions wow. or in these kind of games rather is the fact that I was forced from the outset because he's threatening so many different things on my king so a lot of people like you clearly have are getting your mind blown but when you're in the moment you're like I have to do this yeah. because there's no other option no, I, 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 so I, I, even yeah. when the game ended I didn't think I did anything special until tens tens of people approached me and were like what did we just witness holy smoke <gasps> And my opponent was sporting enough to play until mate. Yeah, because yeah. you, you, like, that, you, like, think about it, like, the odds. Okay, like, first of all, just to find anything, like, mate in five of, of that type of sequence. Yeah, in theory, after the queen takes, everything kind of looks a little bit, obvious. like, obvious. But to be able to pull that off in a tournament classical setting at your level. Yeah. You don't get to see it too often. Often, <laughs> I make a friend. We can run the percentages on that. Wow. I think that's a good way to end it. Matthew, always a pleasure. Thanks, Thank you for having me. Take care. Yes, you as well. Wow.